Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Raising the Bar with myself, John Cooper, and today I'm very grateful to have on the show John Wedger. John is a former Scotland Yard detective that spent 25 years in the force and is now an author and whistleblower who campaigns to expose an establishment cover-up of child abuse. John has travelled around the UK and Europe talking to victims and survivors of child abuse and whistleblowers from a wide range of professional industries, working hard to put pressure on the government and mainstream media to hold power to account and put children first. John, Pleasure. welcome to the show, mate. Pleasure, John. No, I'm really grateful to have you on, buddy. Really and, am. And what a lovely setup. It's lovely, this and it's not a green screen. This is a proper studio we've got here, and uh, you know, this is the reason why we, uh, we've put this together. I've been in a few studios now, and uh, this is by far the, the snazziest, you know. There we go. Credit you know, to the so. team behind the, the <laughs> studios here. Um, we've got a lot to talk about, haven't we? Oh. A lot to talk about. Um, I mean, I've been following your work for quite a while now, um, and I know it's brilliant work, and I know that you've gone through, well, to hell and back, really, from what, I, from what I've uh, you know, read about, On you, many you, about you. On, On many, many levels. On many levels, yeah. So what I was thinking was, could we go into your past and, uh, you know, you worked as a, as a detective um, in, the, in the Met. Um, could we talk a little bit like, about that and the culture in the police, a little oh, bit yeah, like that, yeah, yeah, yeah. what it was like in the, yeah. in the 90s, 80s or, you know, however yeah. far back it went. And then we move into, into effectively the, the cover-ups that were going on, the, the paedophilia, the child abuse, the child trafficking. That is still rife today, right? Uh, yeah, and, and I think, if anything, it's getting worse. Is it? Um, it, it's strange because w w when I joined, the police was very structured, mm. you know, but now it's in disarray and they've got rid of what they call like the old sweats, the old school detectives and coppers, which we, we had a trade craft and um, it was a skill. Mm. And, you know, and they took a lot of effort in, in training you and they did. But now they're, they're just shorter people. A lot of the experience is retired. Some have left um, and they're just pushing people through so quick. Mm. And, you know, the public are always commenting on the difference, and there is a difference. You can tell by their uniform there's a difference. The bobby on the beat isn't anymore. It's very paramilitary. You see with a lot of these um, podcasts that are going out, you know, you know, sort of like these little um, Facebook posts that people are putting out when they have interactions with the police. The police are so robotic mm. and structured, you know, and you're seeing it in America, Canada. We're seeing that the same attitude going on and they've become corporatists you know they really have they're, they're policy they're, officers not really um, exactly people of the streets you know officers that perhaps public uh, servants anymore right and, and some of them are coming across as very thick right. you know you see them with their fingers in and i'm not denigrating them because mm. they were my brothers and sisters and and I'm, i think are proud to serve in the police mm. um at the same time the police have hurt me monumentally they've damaged me i'm not anti-police i'm anti-corruption mm. and when you have corruption you have a virus you know, you have a fungus, you have a disease, that, you know, that, that just sweeps through everything. You can't have corruption. However, in the police, we have corruption in high office. It is in high office. And it's getting worse, would you say? Yeah, yeah because people are, aren't challenging, you know. Mm. Um, and it, it's, it's really odd. I mean, I'll, I'll go through the timeline of my mm. career in a minute, but I will tell you one thing. I've, my journeys took me in and out of Parliament many, many times. I've been before... The great and the good of British politics. Um, I was meant to meet up with the um, Home Secretary a couple of months ago, but due to all this uh, help, whatever we got going on in this country, that that's been put on hold. Um, Theresa May mentioned me once at a, a, a parliamentary meeting when she mm. was PM, and I went before um, a police and crime minister, um, and then I went before my constituent MP, who was a former police and crime minister. And there was um, representatives from, um, I forget who was Home Secretary at the time, I really can't remember, but I, she sent down her, her second in charge. Mm. And it was to do with my role as a whistleblower and speaking out. And some of the, this politician turned around to me and said, John, mm. you know, hopefully this will stop now because there, there's rules, there's legislation, there's guidelines, there's protocols now that whistleblowers aren't bullied. And I said, yeah. And there's laws that saying you shouldn't have sex with children. But do you know what? Kelsa Priest people still do. And this is a level of naivety mm. on, there, on there, you know. You know, they're all saying you shouldn't speed. But everyone, it's just a nonsense. Mm. Unless these things are managed and policed properly, they're, they're futile, they're pointless. Um, and, and this is what happens. And what I found was that the cover-ups went very much to the heart of the establishment. I was then later not only to expose child abuse, but it was then to lead into um, organised criminality. 
I spent a lot of time in the last few years working with ex very serious and organised criminals. Some of them have got massive notoriety, you know, um, not just in the UK but globally, and they're working very close with me. Um, and you know, it has taken me all over the place. But then I started also dealing with a thing called satanic ritual abuse, mm. and this is where it gets dirty. And this is where it then you start seeing cover-ups and the need for a cover-up. So I'd like to spend a bit yes. of time, if I may, John, going Absolutely. into that and and how it manifests and how it hides and, and how it um, manipulates and bullies society as a general. And Absolutely. And, and you can't. And the thing is, if you start to talk about it, you'll immediately get your character assassinated and people start calling you labels like, oh, this is sort of like conspiracy theory mm -hmm. to try and bury it, I guess, because there's so many accounts of this now. It's just getting to the point where you can't hide this anymore. No. And, and I like to go on about victimology, why victims behave the way they do, mm -hmm. why people behave the way they do. Um, and you know, so many people at, at different levels of healing have come to me. Some are resolved and they want to speak out and are comfortable in speaking out. And they want the world to know what went on to them so they can change the world. Mm. Because, you know, in order for healing to take place, you need justice and you need a voice. You need to mm. speak out. You know, and it was strange. There was a survey done about, um, you know, people that have been abused where, where they, the disease and cancers developed. Mm. And one of them was in the stomach because these things make you feel in the stomach, mm. you know. A lot of men were getting bowel disorders. Women were getting, you know, um, uh, womb uh, mm. cancer and things like that. You know, ovarian cancer because of the abuse. But another place was in the throat because mm. they're not speaking out. They can't speak out, yeah. you know, and, and it's just a repression and everything else. So it's about understanding victims. But then you get others, people that have been hurt but go on to hurt. And unfortunately, some of them have come my way and then they've... Mm. Um, gone out their way to cause a lot of problems mm. you know they've got inside uh, the camp as it were and then they've gone on to cause chaos you know and then you've got those that have never been part of the gang but hate me mm. they want to destroy me mm. they see me as a threat and they want to discredit me so, so are we talking about the establishment at this point well, well we yeah i mean the... some of it some of it will be establishment led others will be satanic groups right okay will be pedophiles yeah uh, i mean because they're, they're all connected right so I, I, should, I should imagine that they can all be against you right yeah and and you know someone said to me you're going to get attacked by pedophiles and their protectors because they can't yeah. have me speaking out mm. you know i'm one of the few there's not many police whistleblowers um, there's a few high profile ones, but when you look, and I'm not denigrating anyone because, mm. again, I, I bless them, they're brave. But a lot of them, they spoke out once they'd retired. Mm. You know, I spoke out once I was in, in post and it was very dangerous for me. You know, it was, it was a magnified level of, of danger that I put myself in. Mm. Um, you know, so, and, and I want to go on about how the establishment, you know, will take you down, you know, mm. if you're not prepared to fight. And this is about having the strength and fighting. Mm. This isn't a street fight. This isn't shirts off in a car park mm. or anything like this. This is a spiritual battle. You're going to get spiritually attacked. Mm. You know, uh, you're going to get financially attacked. You're going to get your character assassinated. I've had my whole private life exposed mm. and sploshed all over. But I don't care because I don't mm. do anything wrong. You mm. know, I, there's been acts of stupidity like anyone. Um, but on the whole, I don't care. Mm. I'm not interested and what anyone's got to say about me. I've mm. got, you know, a trolling and all that. I'm really not bothered. Mm. And it's funny when you see the people that do it, you know, they're very vexated. They're hate fueled. They're very dysfunctional. Mm. They're incredibly angry and they've got a problem. Mm. And, um, but there's others that love me for what I do. That's it. And there's a lot of, like I said, very, what would have been dangerous people. Um, they're behind me so much, you know, and I've been with one today. And hopefully he'll come on the show. He's got a phenomenal mm. story to tell. Mm. Tomorrow I'm with um, a former um, prostitute, um, uh, drug courier, and uh, she was a porn actress as well mm. who was trafficked. I'm spending time with her and her friend who's a, a, another very serious ex-gangster, mm. you know. And then the next day I'm working with um, someone who deals with, with, with voodoo. Mm. you know who's exposing voodoo so and this is what my time is but before i worked in a group um it collapsed because it, it was too much infighting too much spite hatred and all sorts of manner of emotions floating around um and i've gone back to how i started off which was on my own 
and I was told by a profiler, I worked with a brilliant woman, she was um, still working with her, she's one of the FBI's top profilers, 10th in the world I think, in the top 10, for uh, child murderers, a lady called Corrine, and she said to me, whatever you do, you work on your own, you work like a submarine, mm. you go under, you come up, yeah. and then you go under again, but you work alone, you'd be a, a link in a chain, don't be part of a group. Who said that? A lady called Corrine. Hutzterbarts. Yeah. I can put you in touch with her. She's yeah. in, there was a, there was a, an infamous um, child murderer, paedophile, procurer of children for for satanic rituals called Mark de Trou in Belgium. Mm. And if you ever want to watch a, a, a great documentary, watch the uh, the Beast of Belgium. Yeah, I think the BBC did a documentary on this man. Mm. He was procuring children for the government, and very similar to what procuring. We saw. Did you say? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Kidnapping, hiding them mm. in in cellars. Um, torturing them, pimping them out to sex parties, and then uh, murdering them. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was all filmed. And when it came out, it, there was members of the uh, royal family in Belgium, the Parliament, mm -hmm. CEOs of business, were all involved in. You know, mm -hmm. and this will really dovetail into to what I'll go on about. Is this sort of around the Ted Heath days? Or is this, this was in the nineties. This oh, was this the mid nineties. Yeah. And and the good thing about what happened in Belgium mm -hmm. was uh, they tried to cover it up which the, the British establishment is phenomenal at doing, mm. covering everything up, you know, look the other way, this is England, oh dear boy, this doesn't go on here, you know, you will blame the foreigners and we'll mock them, but we'll never point a finger at our own mm. sort of thing. And we're seeing that with, with the Epstein thing and with Ted Heath, and I, I can extensively cover a lot of that. Um, but they tried it in Belgium. Now Belgium's not a, not a big country, you know, mm. and it's, um, Demographically, very similar to the UK, mm. an industrial country. Um, I think we've got the same unemployment levels and things I think like that. They've got the highest suicide rates in the world, actually. Yeah, Belgium. yeah, it's 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 a rough country. It's yeah. a tough country, you yeah. know. You know, it's not just you know beer and chips. Mm. It's yeah. um, it's got a lot of problems there, mm. social problems there, and you know, and despite that, just short of a million people took to the streets and protested, mm. and the firemen uh, emptied their hoses, their high pressure hoses on on the parliamentary building blew the windows out because they said this place needs its cleansing, you know, and they took to the streets and because of that, the world knew about it. If they not, no one would have known. Mm. But this lady, um, I've worked very closely with her over the last few years. She profiled him and she goes and interviews child murderers and she's been a, a, a phenomenal insight mm. into the criminal mind, more so than what the police are doing. And one of the uh, arms of my campaigning is that the police are educated properly and hopefully the government inquiry which i was part of you know they've asked me if i would like to have an advisory role in it mm. and and one of the things i said is i, w I want to um uh, be part of the education for for detectives mm. and and teaching them really why people commit crime mm. you know 80 percent of the uh category c under 25 prison population come from abused childhood backgrounds 80 percent mm. so if we solve child abuse we solve a lot yeah you know? Do you trust them though? I mean, like having come from that. No, no. But do, you, do you feel as though there still can be good work done in there? There's still, are there still good people in o there that, are, that, are, that want to see this change? Or yeah, not? yeah, always. Um, you never give up. Yeah. You know, and someone said to me, John, you know, at the end of the day, what are you going to change? And I said, listen, mm. put it this way. I'm never going to stop child abuse. Mm. And I'll be an idiot to think I'm going to stop it, mm. let alone satanic ritual abuse. But if I'm a stone in their shoe, mm. if I'm you know yeah. a, a biscuit crumb in their bed sheet it's better than nothing. yeah yeah you know a little yeah. mosquito bite on their yeah. neck yeah it's better than doing nothing you Absolutely. can't do nothing so if you do nothing children suffer mm. but um if we take this back to your, your original question you know i i joined the police in the early 90s and mm. and culturally uh, and on every level it's totally different mm. to policing now i've been away from the police environment uh, probably since about 2014, officially since 2017, because I, I actually walked out, um, but remained still on their books um, in 2014. 2017, I retired, um, and I've been a detective for a good portion of my career. But I started on uniform policing, not everyone. I started in South East London. And, you know, the early 90s, th there was a problem with crack cocaine and heroin. Mm. Um, I wouldn't have thought it's changed much, but... It, it was a lot more poverty, you know, and street crime going on in, in there. And, there, you know, you had some very impoverished areas, which London's getting heavily gentrified now. 
Mm. You know, a lot of money's been ploughed in, but back then it wasn't. And when I joined, uh, they were going through um, a recruitment phase because they were starting to to retire people. There was a big proportion of people getting retired. So I was part of the, um, I don't know, so they call it Operation Stable Door in the police. You know, this knee-jerk reaction. Shit, we haven't recruited enough people. So a lot of them, when I joined, had come from the 1960s mm. and they had, you know, been very busy in the 70s and the 80s. So it was, they were, you know, they were violent, some of them. It was mm. tough, you know. Were they were they sort of yeah, thugs hand, themselves? A yeah, lot of hands them? on. Yeah, and which I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. It's, mm. it's quite paradoxical because some parts of London, that's how it was, mm. you know. Especially where well, I without joined. Without CCTV, I'm guessing as well. They had you had to sort of look no. after yourself a lot more. There, right? there was no CCTV. Yeah, yeah. Um, they had they just brought in the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Mm. So there's a lot of coppers where you have, prisoners have got rights, but mm. a lot of these blokes worked pre pace as they call it. So there was no prisoners' rights back then, you know, and there was still their mindset was in there, that, that era. Um, and a lot of the people, when you dealt on the street, they expected it. So it was a bit like a, like a school fight, you know, it's who gets the first punch in. Mm. And it was just a f street fight. And it was one thing got me was the violence. I was mm. thinking, it's unbelievable. And it mm. was like a war zone. But there was a bit of honour to them because no one, it was only really when I got into my detective years when I started having knives pulled on me and things like that mm. uh, you know and sort of threats of firearms but on a uniform copper side you, you didn't really get that mm. but people would want to get away and they would have a go at you mm. so um and it was fair cop you know if they um you got the better of them they you'd have a drink with them sometimes you know yeah yeah they'd come over and it they'd, they'd say i remember being in a bar one day and this bloke come over and he said uh all right officer and i think how does he mm. know he said do you don't remember he went no 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 he said to me, "Do you remember the Battle of Looper Street?" And I went, "Oh my God!" And we, it was a, it was a whole housing estate mm. versus us. Yeah. And one cop actually got slashed across the face, which was a bit naughty. But yeah, it was this big fight, and we were just drinking and laughing about it. You know, yeah. who hit who and who what, and it was. But it's, it, it 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 was all right. It was good. Yeah. The, the, the coppers I found there was they were very brave. Mm. Um. You know, I, I talk on the positives and I go on the negatives. Mm. You know, they, they were they were warriors. You mm. know, and I, I was really impressed the girls and the boys. Mm. But one of the things that, that hit me straight away is the police teach you to lie. Now I'm not going to admit to anything on mm. here. Mm. You know, and it'll be up to people to read between the lines of this. But um, on an evidence level, you know, there will be a protocol amongst the officers. You know, and there will be one strong leader within a team mm. so people think the rank structure the sergeants run it and all that well not really it will be you'll have a senior copper who will basically he the sergeants ask him the best way to do it and we mm. and we definitely had one of them he was mm. a fair bloke but he was a tough bloke but yeah. sometimes you know they, they, you go up and do your evidence and the senior cop will throw down his evidence and say right that's the evidence that's the evidence you know right names different but that's the evidence and that's how it was yeah you know i'm not saying i was involved in that i'm not saying i wasn't but i mean so very very soon you, mm. you got learned that this is the culture and if you don't abide by that then that, that, that is it you're ostracized now you must survive in the environment you're in yeah you know that's a given you know so and it was it was in the era, era where corruption was starting to mm. weed out it was still mm. Uh, quite right, especially in in the detective departments, mm. you know. Um, and I never really saw it until a couple of years in. You started seeing, mm. um, you know, how how it really worked, and and that was in the CID. I didn't really see corruption mm. with uniform coppers. I saw a lot of lying. Yeah. Um, I saw a lot of people getting a slap. Mm. Um, I would say eight times out of ten they deserved it. Mm other occasions they didn't mm. um unfortunately for the public you mean you, yeah yeah, it, would yeah. Un unfairly get, get the yeah it was rare you. it was rare yeah. that but, but there were times when someone didn't mm. deserve it yeah and there was mm. unfortunately what happens is that when you're in that environment that that violent environment it becomes part of you mm. and you become violent and so um that's why coppers stick to their own because yeah they understand each other a bit like soldiers do the civilian it's tribal right i guess yeah, yeah, and the, the, the uniform don't... goes on it's a different different character comes out and you drink yeah you know you know there there's not many non-drinkers right you and know? i'm guessing if you don't drink you're not part of the gang you, you ain't no, yeah, no, yeah. no you're not and that's yeah. that um 
However, one guy I work <laughs> with, um, he become an imam. You know, oh, so right. he, went, he went totally the other <laughs> way. Yeah. yeah, the next <laughs> yeah. time I see him, and he was he was um, a drinker and a drug taker and all sorts. Really? And, uh, mm. and the next time I saw him, he become an imam. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, what? He went, yeah, mm. them days are behind me now, yeah. you know. Wow. You know, with the beard, the cloak and everything. Yeah. So we had a little laugh about that. But, um, you know, and a drink, the drinking culture is massive. Right. Um, I, I didn't like the training. I mm. hated the training. I hate regimentation. Um Mm. I couldn't stand it. it. It's really weird because they say it's a civilian police force. However, it's classed as a disciplined service. Mm. So there's a bit of paradox there in what is it, what isn't it? And the um, the instructors, the PTI instructors were all um, ex-army guys. Um, every single one of them, you know, and so they still had that ex-army regimentation. You had to march everywhere. Mm. We had um, members of the Coldstream Guards would take us for parade in the morning. So it was done to a military standard, you know, so all your uniform had to be perfect. And, and you get the same sort of punishments for stupid things like speck of dust, mm. you know, and sometimes they'd have an inspector on parade, officer on parade would come around and smudge your shoes and, and then... The, the army guy would come along and then start screaming at you for your shoes being smashed. Really? Yeah. What was that reason for that? To toughen people I don't know. I, I never got it, you know, really. But the ex-army guys loved it. Yeah. They, they you know, <laughs> they creamed their pants over yeah. it. It was like, oh, no, it's really good. Hated. Mm. See, with me, I hate, hated marching, mm. right? And watching, even back in them tender years, you know, and watching everyone mm. turn left to dismiss from parade. So they'd say parade dismissed or whatever mm. their, their terminology was and they'd all turn to the left and they'd walk two paces and then stand attention and then off they off you wander right and then but watching it all everyone going and everyone when going to the classes you had to go as a group marching you know mm, yeah and you'd have the class captain doing this left right left right stuff i didn't know that went on to yeah yeah it did back then yeah yeah it did back then it was very strict and it made me feel sick because mm. i thought wow this is how nazis are made Mm. This is how indoctr indoctrination well, it's begins. It's cult-like, isn't it? Yeah, and and it is. It's yeah. It it, it really is, and it's yeah. this mantra, and it starts getting under your skin. Yeah. And I'm the the most. I was. I had a lot of self discipline because I used to do a lot of exercise. Mm. Um, but I, I'm a loner. I was born a loner, mm. and I die a loner. You know, I I like my own company. I, I've always had quite a high IQ. Mm. You know, I, a comprehensive education, but I could have done a lot more. Mm. You know, with it, but the opportunities weren't there because. At the time, uh, you know, I, I come from a single parent family. You know, our father died when we were young. Our mum worked in a pub, you know, and, and that's how it was. And I, I was just from a working class area and we're working class friends. And um, But I always achieved everything I, mm. I'd ever did. I was always quite a good achiever. But the police, I struggled with the training because it was regimentation. Mm. And I hated it. I hated every minute of it. And... Uh, what got me through was I was a good swimmer mm. and the recruits weren't allowed to use a swimming pool. They had a beautiful swimming pool. But I used to think, I'm just going in it. So in the lunch break, I would just go swimming. Mm. And the PTI said, no, you're not allowed, you're a recruit. But I'd do it, I kept going. <laughs> and he came up to me one day, he said, listen, I've told you once and you'll, you'll be put on a charge, you know? And if you've got put on a charge, you'd have to parade outside their drill office at six in the morning. Mm and they'd have an early morning parade. It's just stupid mm. crap, you know? Mm. And, but he said, if you can swim a mile, breaststroke, in under 25 minutes, you, you can stay. He said, but the condition is if you do it, you, um, uh, you have to attend wrestling lessons because they had a wrestling club and, and he ran it mm. and uh, no one was attending. So he said, you only have one bloke, you need someone else to wrestle with him. And, you know, I, I was in good shape, you know. I mm. looked after myself and all that. So uh, he went, all right. So I did. I swam mm. a mile, in London, which is competitive level, mm. county level, you know. It, it, uh, probably better than that, to be honest. He went, well done, he said. So he let me swim. And it got me through the training. It got me through. Mm. And I ended up doing wrestling, uh, which, you know, it did save my life, the wrestling, because um, i become good at that. Is that normal to have wrestling for, to, to toughen uh, up the police and get them more sharpened for yeah, on the street? Is it? Yeah, you, yeah. You see it in America; they use yeah. it a lot because everything ends up as a, as, a, as a wrestle anyway. Right. You know, a few punches are thrown, mm. but on the whole, and you can't go up to someone in the street and start jabbing mm. them. It, you know, it always ends up boom, in a grapple. A, yeah, yeah, grapple, and um, yeah. 
and, and it did, you know, the, there was a couple of occasions when, it, you know, I, I could have been seriously, seriously hurt mm. had I not um, done this. And it just taught me get straight in there. And and it was it was funny, it was um, a, a gypsy said to me, um, if anyone mouths off at you, just jump on them. But be careful of those that don't. And uh, I go, well, what are you on about? And with mm. that, he punched me in the face. <laughs> and uh, I said, why did you do that? He said, well, you didn't think I was going to do it. I said, well, no. No, you was quiet. He said, exactly, just be careful. That's all I'm saying. And it's true in the police mm. that the mouthy ones... Um, the quiet you, ones are the ones that yeah, are about to Empty spring. vessels make most noise, as yeah. it were. You know, they yeah. shout and scream and all that. Um, and the squeaky wheel gets the oil, whereas... Mm. They, they found out with the paramedic teams when you go to don't go to the if they're making a noise their lungs are working that their, their, their hearts beat in mm. you know and their circulatory system's working because they're feeling pain leave them leave the mouthy ones screaming the quiet ones are in trouble yeah and and it, it was real a metaphor for for life in general because all the criminals are dealt with you know and then i dealt with child abuse ultimately mm. and these these are, are are the quiet victims you know mm. And they've suffered the most. Yeah. They've suffered the most. Not someone who's had a slap off their husband, not someone who's not advocating domestic violence or anything like that. And I'm always careful what I say because there's always a backlash with me. You know, I'm probably like, it's like having toxic waste on your show as soon as someone gets me. They're like, my God, the trolls are get us. I yeah. tell you, as soon as you yeah. get me on there, boom. Yeah, sorry. I get attacked more times than David Icke. And, um, uh, you, you know, and you get others make a noise, but. It's child victims, you know, and, and it's the same as people on the street. When you talk to them, you know, the beggars, and a lot of them come from the care homes. And that, that's a product of it, mm. living on the street, you know, with abscesses on your arms and a, a crack addiction, kids in care, and it's the whole destruction. Yet they put no resources into it, you know, mm. and they denigrate the victims and they denigrate the survivors and they, and they silence them through, through our justice system. Who, who silences them? I'll, I'll come on to yeah. it. I'll come on to it. It's a bit of legislation called the Bad Character Act. Right. And part of the Criminal Justice Act of 2003. Again, I'm not too sure. Um, no doubt a troll will pick me up and say it's actually 2000 and so and so. But, um, and it, it's how you can assassinate a character legitimately in a court. And... Uh, and, and just destroys everything. And, we, and we've seen that with a few high profile cases, the paedophile cases, when, you know, the victims have been not only attacked, but sent to prison, mm. you know, and, and it starts very early on, this attacking character. And it starts in the care homes, it starts in the schools, and they can use all of this, you know, deeming someone as a liar. So if they don't like someone, they can, they can put them through right. that. They can put them through all that, can they? Well, I tell you, you know, if we jump the timeline yeah. and, and, and I address this point yeah. that you brought up here, John, right? Um, someone who is harboring a drug addiction, mm. for men, they will rob or they will steal, mm. burgle houses or deal drugs or nick from shops or whatever. Mm. Um, the more you get into, you know, the street drug scene, the more the heroin and the class A drugs take a hold, you, mm. you, you know, the more unsophisticated your crimes get because you start losing it, you know? So someone that might have started off as quite a, a, an accomplished, you know, diligent criminal will end up just as a crackhead stealing sandwiches out of Marks mm. and Spencers, you know? Um, because this is the need to do it. Women, ultimately, prostitution is mm. something which will give them instant money very quickly for, mm. for not much effort, do you know mm. what I mean? So it's a good way of paying the drug bill. Mm. Um, but why? Why is someone doing it? Well. Heroin is an analgesic, it's a painkiller. It's a suppressor of pain. Now pain isn't just physical, pain is emotional. Mm. And there was a study done when they found that 90% of the heroin addicts, that, I don't know where it, it was done, whether it was um, over here or abroad, uh, had come from sexual abuse. There's a big correlation between heroin addiction and sexual abuse, childhood mm. sexual abuse. Right, so if you're nicking it, there's, on the whole, a shoplifter is gonna get caught one time in a hundred, you know? Mm. Um, so every time they get caught, that's it. They've had a result one way or another. Um, but they get that on their shoplifting. That's a crime of dishonesty. Mm. So that's going to go down on, on your sheet as dishonesty. Now, at some point in, in, the, in the, the chronology of a person's life, um, and if they end up trusting a policeman or, or, or they want to do the right thing, they're going to say, right, I've got to be honest with myself. Why am I doing it? And they remember their time in the care home. Mm. They remember being abused at home. 
you know, the police come in, they get put in a care home. Mum's no use. Dad's an alcoholic, or, mm. or, or if there is a dad, you know. Yeah. And I really want to talk about the single parent culture. Mm. And I know it, it could upset. I was a single parent. Mm. I feel I'm qualified to yeah. talk about single parenting, and, and I really want to go into this because it's, it, it's one big way of remi make... remedying this appalling situation of yeah, child abuse that absolutely. we've got, and it is. Um, and then they they start getting abused in the care home, which mm. is endemic, especially back in the day, the 60s, the 70s, mm. the 80s, the care homes were endemic for abuse. Why is that, though? I don't get that, because surely like a, an institution like that is meant to care for people, but why, why is it all inverted it, and it just may, gets exploited? Kids are money. Kids are money. Yeah. And look, if you want a woman, you, you go to a pub. Mm. You know, not now, because there's none left, mm, but yeah. I mean... Back, the, back in the day when we were allowed in pubs, you'd, you'd mm. go in a pub and there's women in there, mm. right? So you're going to go where yeah. what your sexy desire is, yeah. you, you know? Um, if you're a paedophile, you've got to go where kids are. Now, paedophiles, mm. on the whole, don't have previous convictions. So these CRB checks, these criminal record right. bureau checks, are, are, are absolutely of no use whatsoever when it comes to child abuse issues. They will always root out a violent person or a, or a deceiver, mm. right? Because on the whole, there is a chronology of crime. If you're violent, you know, you'll start off punching someone at school, then, then whacking someone outside a pub and then using a weapon to hit someone, blah de blah and then shooting, stabbing and whatnot. There, yeah, it's there's clear. A progression yeah. on the whole, on the whole. And the same as with, um, with, with violence. You don't just think, mm. oh, I'm going to get a gun and do an armed robbery. There would have been... Again, this chronology of criminality that's led up to that. Mm. Paedophilia, paedophiles are deceptive people. They're patient people. Um, everything they do is well thought out, well planned, mm. you know. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a cognitive distortion, you know, how they twist things, how they become the victim, how they, they groom, mm. you know. And, and grooming is no different, and this might mm. sound like sour grapes, but how... A guy who's good at chatting up women. Hmm. What does he tell her? He just wants to have sex with her, hmm. right? And that's it, because that's how men are, and that's what they do. Hmm. The women aren't built the same as men. They're, you know, there might be one or two, but on the whole, they want to go out for a drink. And and these blokes, right? I want to have sex. I want to. So they're going to tell that woman everything she wants to know. They're going to tell her how she smells nice, how she looks nice, how this and that. And then he gets his prize, and then he's off to the next one, to the next one. He's a player. Mm. He's a player. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked. Very similar traits. And I'm not saying that players are paedophiles. I'm not. I'm just putting an analogy out there so people can understand the process. Mm. A groomer. Now, it's not a monster that grooms a child. It's a kind man that grooms a child or woman. And I want to go on about females in paedophilia. And and they're, they're nice, you know. They're endearing. You know, they want to, but they've got an agenda. And their agenda is to have sex with that child. Mm. And not just have sex with that child. Well, not really them. kind. They're, they're putting the, of course the persona are. on, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. Um, I ended up, luckily, I was one of the very few coppers that, that, that got trained in profiling. Mm. Uh, it wasn't to a degree standard, but mm. it was a hands-on. I worked with, with one of the best profilers in the UK back mm. then. Um, a guy that was based in Southern Ireland. And, you know, I learned so much from him. And there's there's one of the um, the videos that when, they, when they're working with paedophiles... Mm. And it's all to do with grooming, how grooming works. And they put um, a guy in a chair and they sit him down and another paedophile's job is to to convince him to get off the chair. Mm. You know, whatever it takes, get him off that chair. No violence, no nothing. So he'll, he'll tell him, hello, mate, you know, it was all nice. Come and mm. stand up to see what you look like. And that other guy's brief is just do your best to stay in that chair, you know. And of course he doesn't, he doesn't move, he doesn't do it. But this fellow is nice, he's offering him a cigarette, he's offering some some chocolate. Mm. And ultimately, the paedophiles can't control himself, right? And then he flips and the monster comes out. And then the next thing, you watch this video and it was so consistent with all the people that were put mm. in the scenario. And he, once he's had enough, he's had enough. And, it's, yeah, and he just tears into the bloke mm. who's on the chair. And he said, that's what happens when the child doesn't acquiesce. Yes. The yeah. monster comes out. So... Mm. It's not a monster that grooms a child. These paedophiles are monsters. Mm. They are monsters. They're evil. Mm. Um, but it's only... And, and I um, interviewed a very high-profile child murderer once, a woman. 
and um, I become a specialist interviewer, and it was it was just mm. I've got a natural ability to communicate, mm. and luckily the police recognised it. You know, one of the good things they did do, and they exploited it, mm. um, and I'm glad they did because it took me all over the place. You know, mm. doing all sorts of things and ultimately teaching these skills, and, and same with this woman. She was endearing. She was nice. She, she was that, all that, but then the moment I cross-examined her. And the moment, because there is there is a skill when you mm. get into that level of interviewing, and it, it's neuro linguistic programming yeah. part of it, and a lot of it is is understanding how people work, and that was it. She just kicked off. She, you know, the moment she realised she'd been rumbled, yeah. she called me a C next Tuesday, spat in my face, and just right. went mad. Oof. And it happened like that. And I said, mm. "There you go. That's that's a monster your son sees." Mm. And I, I, even a solicitor was he was just dumbfounded. He just because yeah. that's know the what thing to, you. People don't realise there's plenty of female paedophiles, right? There are, there it's not are. we we have this image of the paedophile being the kind of the, the, the almost like the, the outcast white yeah. middle aged nerd, middle aged mid nerd, right? White man yeah. living with yeah. his mum. Yeah. You know, bit of a loner, very polite, yeah. you know, like the Thomas Hamilton, mm. the, you know, the Dumble murderer. Uh, but it's not. No. You know, and this is one of the things that I set out to do. And I tried to do this in the police, you know, to yeah. change what paedophile looks like. I dealt with paedophiles that, that were good-looking Kosovan, mm. Albanian refugees, good-looking guys, you know, mm. like young Italian lads, mm. um, young Jamaican guys, mm. um, Greek guys, white guys, mixed-race guys, you know, young, in their 20s and 30s, are mm. having sex with young kids mm. and women, and women. Um, the one thing you'll find with women is a deception that a man can't, can't um, attain. There is a level of spite and deception that goes along with women and yeah. abusing. Um, so that, what are they doing to the kid? I don't want to go too, but I, I, I kind of need to know this. Like what levels are these women going to? I mean, I mean, there, there was, what, there was, what what, there was one. Molesting or? Yeah, sexually abusing. I mean, I mean, there was um, one one woman, she was uh, getting her, um, her child and she was getting the feet of the child and she was putting them up a vagina um, and, and sort of reenacting the birth of the child yeah you know all the time one a woman was um putting um like sugary stuff whatever um on on her vagina and getting her little baby because the baby's in they've got a natural ability to suckle yeah and so instead of breastfeeding the baby she was putting on a clitoris and the baby was she was doing that um mm. uh one one guy was in a, in a care home mm. And he said, uh, you know, that the men were abusing him. He said, but the women were the worst. And he said, there was loads of us, young boys from six to 13. And every day, every day, we'd have to go to the school hall. We all had to strip off naked. Mm. So you're getting boys prepubescent and pubescent. Mm. You know, we'd all have to line up. And the head mistress of the school would sit there and make all the girls of this residential school watch. They were all clothed. While um, she took them one by one, she caned them and fiddled with their genitals. And then off they went to get changed and then get ready for their evening meal. Every night that went on. Every night. In a care home. In a care home. Every single night. You know, uh, and it, you know, um, I've heard of uh, people having their genitals whipped. Mm. Um, one guy told me that he's, um, I, it's so sad. He was a lovely man. He helped survivors. Lovely old man. And there was pain in his voice. I said, what, what, what's your story, my mm. friend? He went, no, I'll, I'll just help. I said, why? Everyone's got a reason for doing this. Mm. And he said, well, I, I, I was in a care home. And um, he was made to strip naked. And uh, a woman teacher would, would whip his penis with a ruler so badly that it ruptured it and he could never get an erection. And what was sad about this, he said, you know, this, he was 80 years old, this man, mm. old man telling me. And he said, what was sad thing about this is that um, back then you, you never had sex until you were married. And you would court a girl, you know, you'd take a girl out. And I, I was in love. Mm. I wanted to marry this girl. She loved me and I loved her. But I couldn't get an erection. And um, we planned a marriage. And I jilted her because I knew that I could never sexually give her what she wanted. Mm. And I had to run away. I, I was too, didn't have the balls it was too much and i did mm. it not for me but for her because mm. i would never be out sexually please her. i'd never be able to have sex with her because his penis wouldn't work in that way because it mm. just been whipped mercilessly by a woman with a ruler when he was a boy mm. so you know it, and the sat satanic abuse 
takes that to an even darker mm. level. That takes it to, you know, a murdering level. Um, you know, and if we could... Yeah, so we have the paedophilia, towards... basically, and that kind of permeates, I would say, almost all institutions. It's, it's part of every part. It's, yeah. it's, it's there everywhere, right? But then you, it kind of goes into more of the darker well, aspect well, of paedophilia, right? Well, is, there, is there like a kind of a, a link between it all, or is yeah. it just separate, two separate things? You yeah, you'll, you'll find a lot of the problems in society are down to paedophilia, yeah. a lot of them. Um, and what, what you have in society, you have economic crime. They give it all mm. these stupid names now, mm. but... On the whole, you know, um, it's a reserve of the lower and the working classes, the council estates, right? Mm, yeah. Where it's petty just crime. Petty yeah, minded, yeah, car yeah, thieving, yeah. burglary, yeah. people robbing their own people, mm. you know, mugging each other and all that. You know, it's, it's brain damaged crime, it's idiotic, stupidity, mm. poverty driven crime. Yeah. Um, so I just bit interested him. However, paedophilia is different. Mm. Paedophilia knows no social boundaries. Mm. It knows no religious boundaries. It knows no economic issues. It, it, it just knows no gender issues. It is like a hot knife through the butter of society. It mm. cuts through everything. Mm. And it will unite so many people. Um, and that's why you will see organised criminals mm. knowing MPs. That's why you'll have MPs knowing prostitutes. That's why, you know, all these, you know, MPs will know lower class people. And you think, how do they mm. know each other? And... You know, I'll keep picking on pick MPs here, but... Um, but can I just start before we go, what is it about children that's so appealing as opposed to just a prostitute thing? Uh, ch children, it's all about power. Um, right. They enjoy sex with children. Uh, these are damaged people mm. uh, that get an immense amount of pleasure from having sex with a child. It invigorates them. Mm. You know, um, if we stick with a man, a man having sex with... with a seven-year-old girl this isn't a man that could pleasure a grown woman you know there's a problem there a, a deep-rooted mental mm. cognitively distorted issue going on um, they enjoy it mm. they enjoy the pain it gives them the fear it gives them um and the pain it gives them yeah well the pain it gives a child you know oh, the pain it gives the child you know yeah. uh, they, they enjoy it right, I, yeah. I, I said to one guy i said right come on now you know what yeah. is it what is it and he said, I remember being in a flat with three other paedophiles mm. and we wanted to get a boy. Right? And he said, have you ever seen heroin addicts without any drugs? Yeah. So I said, oh, all the time. He said, they were pacing up, pacing up, pacing up and down, pacing up and down. He said, and then the mobile phone went mm. and the call came from the fellow that was out scouting for a kid. I don't know where he was procuring it from. Mm. And he said, I've got, I've got us a boy. And he said it was like everyone, it was like a, a pressure cooker letting the valve open. He, everyone relaxed. Oh, God. And he said, and when you have sex with that boy, you felt high, you felt invigorated. And, you know, and it's food for him, you know. These are people that enjoy what they yeah. do. Is there know? any and, uh, preference? Do they, do they prefer a boy uh, to a girl, these no, paedophiles? Yeah, they, they will have a preference. Yeah. Uh, but what they call paedophiles, mm. they're trisexual. Right. They're not homosexual. Mm. They are not bisexual. They're trisexual. They will try anything. Right. right? Okay. Call it trisexual. And um, it's, it's just a bastardization of a term, you know. Mm. Um, so, again, we'll just stick with men. You know, I will come on to the women. Yeah. You know, I'll, yeah. I'll reserve a little place for the women when I deal with the satanic stuff and, yeah. and what they've been involved in. You know, you know, with a man, he wants, he likes prepubescent, pre-seven-year-old. Um, the age means a lot as well. Mm. Um, some like babies. We saw that with Ian Watkiss, the uh, Lost Prophet singer, mm. you know, uh, abusing babies, you know, and a, a lot of his files have been locked away for 40 years. Mm. Why? Mm. You know? Um, so we all like a, a seven year old prepubescent girl, but he, he'll have sex with, with, with a teenage boy, you know, but that's what he likes. They've got their demographic, what they want, you know, what mm. they, you know, they prefer, but they, they are a danger to all children. All children are a danger to. Um, and, and it's a strange thing is when if I go back to like my early years in the police, um, it was never it was never formed part of the training. Mm. We did four days on dangerous dogs and and, and racial issues, mm. you know. Uh I never saw corruption in the uniform thing. I saw stupidity in the mm. uniform branch, I saw um ego driven mm. morons really, you know. Uh, CID, I saw corruption. Um, racism, I'm saying no, this is going to shock people. Mm. No, no. 
not on my level. Mm. It went on. Of mm. course, it was no different to racism that I saw. In fact, it was less than mm. racism saw when I was doing my apprenticeship, mm. you know, when I was at Evening College, when I was working on building sites. The building sites were, were a lot more racist than the police. Yeah. Without a doubt, you know, mm. uh, you know, it was effing this and effing that and um, and sexist and that. There's no way you'd get away with that in the police. Mm. Uh, the police was too regulated, so I never saw, and I never saw homophobia either. Mm. There was banter, yeah. and there was raw banter, mm. but everyone was part of it. Mm. The gay officers would be part of it. Yeah. The Jamaican officers would be part of it. And like mm. I always said, the ones who got picked on the most were the gingers. Yeah, I the know. Gingers. They're the ones that always got it. They don't get any sport, do they? No one supported job. them, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so yeah. ginger phobes got away with it. Yeah. But So I never saw racism, and yeah. you know. Um, but then again, why would I? You know, mm. um, I'm not a black officer. I got mm. called gypsy a lot because they thought I was a gypsy. Right. Um, and a senior officer once asked me if I would like to challenge it and because and, and, some mm. officer called me a, a pikey and I was like, yeah. I don't care, I'm not, mm. I'm, I'm not bothered. It just, mm. it, it really didn't interest me. High up, mm. yes, there is. Mm. And there's also sectarianism. Mm. There is sectarianism. Catholics, they don't tend to like Catholics going anywhere. Mm. We've got a very Protestant police force. Mm. And if you go to Glasgow, Strathclyde, it's all Protestant, all Protestant. So it's, there's a lot of sectarianism, you know. There's a lot of masonry. Which I'd like to tap yep. on a little bit. A yeah. lot of ma and yep. masonry um, has a massive steer. Well, it did back then. A Should we steer. tangent off into that quickly? Or do you, or is it, did you want to bring it around? Do you want to tie the loop um, on what you were... Well, well I, never, I never encountered masonry. I didn't know what masonry was, to be yeah. honest. I'd heard of them. Yeah. And they, they used to call them the Larrys, the Larry Graysons, mm. the Masons. And, uh, uh, I, and it would be mentioned. And I never, it was never really until I started working with older coppers. Yeah. And they'd say, oh, he's in my lodge. And I went, yeah. what's that mean? Mm. And then I started knowing about it. And then I ended up on a specialist department. I specialised quite a lot, which was brilliant. Some people never specialise. Mm. Um, some do it once. I did it many times, and, uh, and I definitely saw it as a way forward. I loved it mm. going on to specialist departments, but masonry was endemic, mm. absolutely endemic in them, and they all knew each other. They were all connected with each other. There was people would would get jobs, and you wouldn't know how they'd be fast tracked because always, yeah, always, yeah. you know, and they'd, they'd be picked for this and picked for that, and they were useless, inept, mm. moronic, lazy, mm. whatever, you know. And it was never really done on merit in the police. I never saw people really promoting on merit. Mm. There were those that did, but they had to work hard. I was one of them. I had to work hard yeah. uh, for what I got. But I had an inc I was just very good at policing. I was just naturally good at it. Yeah. Some people are naturally good at gymnastics. Some are naturally good boxers. Or mm. I was good at that, and it caused a lot of jealousy. And then one day, I, I went for a job, and... I, this was the first time I've been silenced. I was I was tracking down transient paedophiles mm. um, that were living on canal boats, and it was a cracking number. And a lot of the older lads were, were all masons. This was the first time I started seeing it, and a few of them would have there'd be a ring mm. on my oh, right. finger there. One used to wear a watch with all like um, mm. uh, what's the what's the Jewish language? Um, Hebrew. Hebrew. Yeah. Hebrew, because um, it's all to do with Solomon. There's a lot. Yeah, that's right. Of Jewish Star of David, it. isn't it? Yeah, and it, be, uh, it was all to do with King Solomon's temple or yeah. something like that. Yeah. And so there'd be a lot of Hebrew inscriptions on his watch, mm. and that was always Masonic. And a handshake would give it away. Mm. They, they'd do a knuckle rub thing where they'd, they'd rub their, depending on what level they yeah. were. You know? I mean, how many, how many of the police do you think were? Um, uh, I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know. They weren't all overtly. I know that, that if you take things like the dog unit, yeah, um, probably maybe seventy eight percent were seventy eight percent. Yeah, yeah, the, the male ones. When yeah. Women aren't allowed to. Um, when I was in the vice unit, I'd say a good half of the men wow. were, were were masons. Um, but I, I was on this one tracking down paedophiles, and it got so big. Mm. You know, it was absolutely massive. Well, I was expected to, to locate two paedophiles mm. in two months, and I located 90. And it started then moving on to some politicians were mentioned involved with it, mm. and, and it got shut down. And I said, right, you're off, you're off this unit. It's shutting down, but you, we can have any job you want. Um, and I said, mm. well, I want to stay here. I yeah. want to carry on doing this. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, you know, we haven't got the funding for it. And in the end, it, I was told it come from high up shut him down back him down and then i got told by 
uh, a senior officer at, at the um, paedophile unit at Scotland Yard, you, you trod on toes, you know. It was, you got very good at what you did and they came mm. for you. So it wasn't a first, that was a first time, but it wasn't going to be the last time. So that was the first moment that you went, hang on a minute, there's something yeah. going on here. Yeah, I was working for, I was, I was seconded to the paedophile unit, I was on the river police, mm. and I was tracking down transient paedophiles that were living on canal boats because they had a loophole. So it wasn't a complete cover up, they would still send officers in to deal with it? Well, it was the fact that information was coming from the prisons. Right. And, and there was pressure to track down transient paedophiles. You didn't know where what they does went. that mean, transient? Sorry. But, well, they, they're not signing on, on the sex offenders register because they just brought in the sex offenders register right. in 1997. And these, these um, paedophiles were just going missing. They were going all over the place, didn't know where they were. Mm. And there, there was information because the police work on informants, you know, on that level, on that sort mm. of detective level. It's all informants. And the information was coming from the paedophile community in mm. uh, prison that when you get out, they've got the sex offenders register. They can't catch her. If they catch her, they monitor you. If they monitor you, they can come into your house. If they come into your house, game's over for us all. So don't get on that register. So yeah. um, they had 28 days to register themselves on release or conviction or caution for a Schedule 1 sexual offence. Um, and they weren't doing it. And now if you get on a canal boat, mm. you, police don't go on canals. And canals, um, they're, they're on boundaries. They form boundaries, you know, borough boundaries. So London's very unique mm. in as much as we've got all, we've got one police, well, we've got two police forces in London. We've got the City of London, which are very bizarre because City of London don't sign an allegiance to the Queen. They're not, mm. they're not linked to the Crown. Right, I City didn't know that. Only police force in the Commonwealth that doesn't have the King Edward's coronet, the, the Crown that you right. see on the badges. They've got Griffins. Oh. They, 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 yeah, they, they're, they're to do with some financial thing. They're, um, and the uh, Parliament have no control and the Queen has no control over the City of London Police at all. Okay, yeah, very, very bizarre bunch. Yeah. Um, really odd. So, and I, funny enough, I had that when I was meeting with, with a, a parliamentarian mm. uh, for police and crime and he turned around and said, you know, we, we've got no power over them. I said, when I say it's a conspiracy, he went, no, no, no. He, he said, you're right. I can't tell them what to do. I can tell every other chief mm. constable what to do yeah. or advise them what to do, but I can't tell that lot anything. Mm. He wow. said, we've got no power over the city of London. Very, very odd. Um, so you've got all these other county forces, Hertfordshire, mm. Bedfordshire, Cambridgeshire and all that. They're their own entity. London is made up of different boroughs. Mm. And each one is, in effect, its own little police force, right? Mm. So each one's its own police district. So you could have a, a canal boat on the River Lee. Mm. And to the left, you could have Waltham Forest. Mm. To the right, you could have Hackney. Mm. And to the north, you could have, I don't know, Enfield, you mm. know, and it'll all be within five minutes. So you could flip about. Mm. So 28 days, got to register as a sex offender, who just moves over there. Don't have to register. Oh, right. And kids like boats. Yeah. And a lot of these sex offenders were setting themselves up as respite carers for special needs kids. Um, there was one, he was working for a tour company, taking children from Camden Town Mm. Camden Town on, on a school trips to London Zoo on a canal boat and he was put in charge of toilet patrols he was a prolific paedophile and he was a young lad and he, he was actually a good looking lad you know mm. you know the, the girls would have liked him but he liked little girls and so there was everywhere anyway it just exploded it's, it's massive information um, it was coming in from all around the world as soon as I put myself out this is what I was doing it was just filtering in I was didn't realize how big it was it mm. was just incredible and it got shut down very quickly and i said i want to carry on working with kids and the vice unit had come out right so um they'd wanted advertised for officers to join the vice unit again an elite unit mm. you know brilliant unit they went all around the world um they dealt with casino crime they dealt with prostitution they dealt mm. with nightclubs oh man it was it was a want to have you know um and it was like a, a plain clothes posting. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll have that. Mm. And it was very hard to get on, you know, back then. And this is when I first saw a masonry. And the guy that I've been working for is Detective Sergeant. He was a mason. Mm. And he said, uh, where's the advert for this job? And I went here. And he, and he saw applications to inspector mm. so-and-so. And he went, it's in my lodge. I went, mm. what's that mean? He went, you watch. Rings him up. And he said, look, um, got a lad applying for that job 
he said, and you can hear him saying, yeah, he's a good kid. He's a really good kid. You know, but he's you not know, in the lodge. <laughs> you know, no, no, he's not in the square. They used to say he's not in the right. square. Um, and uh, but because I worked hard for this guy, he, he liked me. You know, mm -hmm. so he said, I'm prepared to sponsor you. And the next thing, he, he goes and gets a pen and paper. He's on the phone, and he just writes down a few lines. Mm -hmm. He went, yeah, see you at the next meeting. Phone goes down, and he passes me this, and he goes, right, there's every single question you're going to be asked, and there's the answer. And that's how it worked. And you had to abide by the... Uh, well, well, they, they give you a, what they call a reading list. Right. And they say you're going to be asked questions. You don't know what they are. It's, you go oh, for, sorry, these are for the interview. For or, the interview, right, yeah. yeah. You go for yeah. an exam. Yeah. In, in effect, you go before a panel and they, right. and they might ask a question. If you haven't revised the legislation, mm. you, so when you go for a specialised, you, you've got to swat up on all the legislation. Mm. So you have to know all the law about this, mm. maybe firearms, you need to know about guns and all that. Mm. And then they train you as well, but you need to show a willingness mm. and you need to be capable mm. when you get in there. And also certain areas you work, they, they would like you to know that area of London mm. as well. So you can't say, well, I don't know where I'm going. Well, it's not good enough. Yeah. You know, you, you know, you're part of this team, you behave like part of the mm. team. Um, so I was given all these answers. I was like, right, don't let me down. And uh, yeah. and I just walked it, just just walked straight through it. Um, so I'd, I'd gone from gone from uniform policing I, I i went from south east london to west end mm. um in the meantime my missus um at the time had left me and left me with four children mm. so i'm now bringing up four kids on my own she had uh problems um deep-rooted problems and um that was it i was left mm. on my own didn't get a penny from anyone mm. the oldest two weren't even my kids no. we're going to put the oldest one in care because he was um a bit wild should we say because mm. he'd had a rough time mm. uh, not not of me but beforehand um so i went through four years at a family court on a personal level and i took on these kids you know um uh, never got anything from the courts because i didn't qualify for anything so it's hard for me mm. it was hard for me and um the, the poor boys that you know they it was tough for them as mm. well you know mm. uh, but i kept my private life separate from from my work mm. you know i never went to welfare i never brought anything mm. but i was working hard you know and luckily mm. i had a good family that did step in and help good friends that stepped in and helped mm. so i got through it so i understand single parenting mm. and i understand the anguish of kids when there, there, there was a parent missing mm. and my boys grew up without a mum and the youngest boy was nine months so it was hard for him you know it was hard for me but you know again it's not always about me you know um but I had an understanding of kids. So, but the last thing I wanted to do was work with kids mm. because I was dealing with my own kids. Mm. But then I started realising, you know, th there is a correlation between crime mm. and, and what the kids have suffered. And then there was a fella early in my service. I was a jailer one night helping out in the cells. And he said, can I have a cigarette? He'd take me out for a cigarette. And I always took people out for a cigarette, always. Mm. And they kept them quiet. I always give them a cup of tea and a cigarette. Mm. Others wouldn't. You know, I'm, I don't believe in smoking, and mm. you know they're, they're they're just snobs, you know. And and I said, why, why are you on heroin? What's it? And he went, mm. well, if you had my life, um, you'd be doing drugs. I went, what do you mean? What what, what do you mean? He went, I was in a care home, and I was raped in a care home. And I went, how old was you? And he was a young kid, and he went through mm. this awful story. And he said, and I end up in trouble and and getting hit a lot um, at school because back then they could hit you, the teachers. Mm and it just made it worse and I, you know and i just had all the pain so i was drinking mm. and then i did cannabis you know and then i went on to do um ecstasy and heroin and and then off i went a smackhead and then i just spent my life burgling houses but it, it's all down to abuse so very early on i i realized that you know this is important it's the root of it all the root yeah. of it yeah there was no education in it. it was seen mm. child protection was seen as a job for lactating mums mm. so women that come back from maternity leave mm. shoved them on child protection uh, they did you know they would do sod all to help them i'm mm. not denigrating uh, mm. you know at the end of the day if they want to address the balance and they come on and they mm. address the balance i'm going to say it as i experienced it mm. you know and there were some good women i worked with and well i'm not going to rubbish you know a whole swathe of uh, people mm. but there were others that were absolute snobs. There was a lot of women on child protection that had no children. Mm. So what would they know about kids? Mm. They didn't understand poverty. Mm. They were married to coppers. Um, so they had the income of a middle-class family. Mm. 
they were living in middle class areas mm. because there was a financial incentive if you bought a house in a posh area. Mm. I lived on a shit council estate mm. uh, full of idiots. And again, I'm not knocking people living on council estates. I'm telling it as it was, you know. Uh, and it was just a horrible place I was living on because that's all I could afford. Mm. I, I had a mortgage. Um, and I was living in poverty mm. with my kids. My kids went to the worst school in the area um, with problem families and everything. I had um, a, a crackhead prostitute living opposite me. Mm. Um, I had other people. I was burgled. It was just horrible. Mm. It, was yeah. just a, it was just an absolute nightmare. Um, uh, you know, but then I was going to work with people that, that would go on all-inclusive holidays to Kenya, mm. that had Vogue SE Range Rovers, you know, and it weren't my, I had more in common with the prisoners I was bringing through yeah, the door say, than yeah. those I was working with. Maybe that's why it took you on this path. Well, it, 100%, 100%. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, one, of the, one of the criticisms that actually come out of a government inquiry, I think it might have been into the Victoria Columbia thing, was snobbery. Mm. And it's something I brought up when I was at, giving evidence at the government inquiry um, late last year and um, was a snobbery element and this was basically it that, that they were sort of middle class people that just didn't want anything to do with the lower classes yeah. and there was one woman wouldn't do a home visit because she would get scabies mm. at, well she thought she'd get scabies off of this council flat family mm. and take it back to her precious little darlings mm. that were living you know in the outskirts or wherever you know Bromley or wherever mm. it was you know um, and, and they were, they were, they were, they were terrific snobs, you know, very rare would you get a really down to earth, um, street sort of person joining the police. It was very, very rare, mm. you know, um, and that was one that you see the simplest answer is usually the correct one. So that was a failing mm. on one level, but only one level. Mm. Um, I was later to find out that there were bigger failings because there was a concerted effort by chief constable level. Mm. and military intelligence level to prevent disclosure um, of abuse, especially in in um, institutional care homes um, like uh, Beach Home, uh, which was down in Wandsworth where kids were taken um, to Elm Guest House, uh, which was down in Barnes and they mm. were pimped out to MPs. Right. Um, I, I was told of mainly Tory MPs back in the day, but it, you know, it, mm. it, it's, it knows no, uh, it's inter-party, yeah, it's yeah. inter-party, um, who were having sex with young mm. boys. Um, I've been told of, uh, one fellow where he, him and his twin sister were taken to Elm Guest House as, as young five-year-olds and made to perform sexual acts on each other. While, um, there was one politician w was round in the room and there was, um, uh, a high court judge was there, you know, mm. um, and then they would have sex with them and then make them have sex with each other. I, I would know of. With a high court judge? Yeah, yeah, high court judge. Who, who, who was still, uh, I was told he's still presiding now. Oh my God. In, in the Crown Court circuit. Um, one guy, he was, he was anally raped. He was beaten as a young boy. Mm. Um, and then taken to sex orgies where numerous men would, would only rape him um, and he said uh, um, one of the men was his parole officer one was the Crown Court judge who sent uh, who later um, sentenced him to an armed robbery oh and one was uh, the social worker that was putting him in there you know so where do these kids turn yeah they've got nowhere oh, to turn dear, dear. and, and, and no wonder know, they end up with a bit of escapism yeah, yeah the of drugs. course I mean, it kind of makes sense and, it? It, and it's only when you pick the scab you realize yeah. this so i was working with people that were going on about oh i want to get on the flying squad organized crime mm. and all that well you know the flying squad what do they do they protect the banks mm. in essence mm. you know they're, they're like a, a little unit in the police that just deal with bank robberies mm. and bookies well the, you know bookmakers cause so much poverty mm. casinos cause incredible amounts of poverty mm. and so do banks banks make people homeless mm. you know um, and yet they get the cream, the so-called cream of the British police and unlimited funding. Whereas mm. those that are out there protecting children, you know, mm. you get just put down, yeah, silenced and attacked. So I went on to the vice unit and um, I was dealing with street prostitutes to start with. And, mm. and, I, and I did very well there. I, I really enjoyed it. And all the all the prostitutes had all mm. come from the care system and right. had all been sexually abused. Yeah. 
Yeah. Everyone I spoke to um, had been sexually abused, every single one. They were all harboring crack cocaine and heroin addictions, so they all come from the care rooms. Mm. So I started working mm. with a couple. They were become my informants. Right. And then they started giving me information about who was using them, and then they started saying, look, there's, there's, kids, there's kids involved. Mm. And some of the clients want us to get kids. Other, other street girls are procuring their children or their family's children. Were they happy to give you this information? Because I, I, I'm, I'm supposing that they were part of that network and making money from it. Yeah, yeah. So well, was there a little bit of a conflict of interest? They, they, only, they only got paid if there was a conviction. Um, right. But there was other ways of helping them, you know. Yeah. You could get them into rehab centres and, mm. and things like that. You could leave them alone, you know, so they, they could work basically with impunity, you yeah. know. And you wouldn't touch them, you know, or you'd pick them up, make out your nick and drop them around the corner, you know, things yeah. like that. You can make life easy for them. If they give information that resulted in conviction, they got paid. Right. But on the whole, a lot of the information they gave, you know, mm. wasn't financially viable. But mm. a lot of them, they did it because they didn't like what, they what, what, what was going on. Yeah. And they would also tell us of coppers. Mm. They said there's policemen come here and pick up the girls as well, you know. And so I started working with that information and then I was moved on very quickly. And I worked with on casino crime. Mm. I investigate casino crime, which was incredible. Just absolutely my there was two of us in the whole world. Mm. A majority of it was perpetrated by Turkish gangsters. Um Pedophilia or no, 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 just cheating casinos. Right. Just cheating right. casinos. So I got taken out on there. But I ended up going back to working with the children because mm. I started dealing with the Turkish mafia mm. um and there was uh, an attempt on my life. Mm. Um, because I'd caused a lot of problems. I seized a lot of heroin. Right. Um, I was being used by the National Crime Squad to get information mm. uh, because some of the people started talking to me and giving me information about heroin importation, mm. which then led me into serious and organised crime. Mm. Um, and I would be sent into the prison system to interview mm. gangsters in the prison who were giving me information. And there was a trade for their liberty and for money if they gave the right information. So... Um, I started dealing with informants mm. on, on like a national and it, it ended up going to an international level because some of the stuff was going abroad. Um, but then there was an attempt on my life. Um, so I was moved away from that right. very quickly. Um, and I ended up um, asked to make a, uh, an investigation into a, a young girl who had come forward and it was Zoe. I can name her because she's dead. Um, and I'll be dedicating part of my my book, you know, the, mm. the autobiography to, to this girl because a um, very, very brave young girl that come from the care system and she had reported that she was being pimped out many times to the police and they just ignored her. And she, she was persistent, she kept coming forward, but she was heavily involved with, with organised crime. Mm. She was only about 14. Wow. And I went to see her. Again, anti-police, and this mm. is a problem as well, you're not dealing with... Mm with a nice commodity here, mm. you know. Um, they put a lot of emphasis now on brothels. Mm. But you're dealing with adults. And to be honest, a lot of adults have a choice. Mm. You know, that might not be the case with some of the human trafficking, but in my experience with Vice, the girls that come over from Lithuania, Latvia, and that, they'd worked mm. in brothels in France and in Italy and Germany, and then they made it here, and they'd make allegations they were being exploited, but it was just a financial dispute between them and their pimp, mm. on the whole, you know? And so there wasn't any exploitation element, you know, they just used it to their advantage, and it was on vogue mm. to show this as some Russian mafia exploitation of women from the Eastern Bloc over here, like like a Taken film with Liam Nielsen, yeah. absolute bullshit. Right. That weren't the reality. Mm. That was not the reality. But under the veneer of that were children. Mm. Children were being taken to brothels. Children were being taken to private venues. Children were being put on the street. And no one had looked into it. And whenever the kids come forward, uh, uh, they were told to go away. Now, one girl about a year previous to me taking this investigation on, had um, we, we picked her up in, in um, Market Road in Islington. It was a red light area back then. It was just up by Pentonville Prison. And um, she was 14. She was on crack cocaine. She was very small, but because of uh, shit diet and living, you know, that lifestyle, she looked 10, 11, mm. you know. Um, and she's out there on the street 
you know, loitering, prostituting, whatever you call it. You know, I get attacked. John Wedder calls them prostitutes. Well, it is what it is. You know mm. what I mean? It is what it is. It's not... I'm here for the children, not against them, you know. Mm. Um, and she had scabies, and a lot of them had contagious hepatitis, tuberculosis, mm. you know. We're going on about all this scare now, this pandemic, but, you know, what about tuberculosis? Yeah. And that is massive. It's, yeah. it's a huge problem, you know, yeah. and, it's, and it is contagious. That is contagious, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and so I put her in the car and said, look, I picked up so-and-so, and then come over the radio, get rid of her. I went, why? I said, get rid of her. She's got scabies. Mm. She'll infect the car. The car will be off the road. Um, and then that's you stuck in the office dealing with her. And then if you take her back to the office, because we had a, a room for them, mm. and we used to let them smoke. Mm. They, there was a room in the police station where they, they were allowed to smoke. Mm. Like 14 year olds, they, mm. give them fags and let them smoke. It was, it was mad back then. And they said, um, don't take her back to that room. Um, uh, it was at Charing Cross Police Station because she will infect that as well. Mm. And get rid of her. Didn't she came in? Yeah, you know, but um, oh but that was the attitude. That was the attitude. Mm. You know, now anyone who had sex with that girl, that was rape. That's thirty years. Mm. So really, instead of a man picking up a prostitute mm. for a fifty quid fine, which wasn't even a Schedule One offence, mm. so it wasn't a serious offence. It was a low level C crime, at like the bottom crime. It went C, B, and A. No, A, B, and C. So anyway. Um, mm. You know, low level, they were interested in that. But when you've got a high level crime like this, a rape of a child, they weren't interested. You know, so this is how oh, the, 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 the system works. And it's it's never been about um, people, money and all that. And you've got to look at the inception of the police. And I'll go back to Zoe in one sec because this is where it all started for me. The, the police was formed in 1798. It was a Marine Police of London. And what was happening was that the um, empire was big and the boats were coming in from all over the, the planet mm. um, into what they called the Pool of London, which was sort of around the East End, all the way up Tower Bridge, and the docks were built, and the ships were there, and they were moored up, and they started to spoil some of the goods, so there was a need to get these boats moving. Mm. But when the sailors went ashore mm. for night leave, especially in the East End, they were murdered because the East End was rough mm. and it was bad lands back then, and they were killed. And they were losing so many sailors through mm. robberies, murders and everything else mm. that they, the, the shipping company said, we're relocating to Amsterdam. We, we're not coming into London, it's too dangerous. You sort this out. So they set up a paramilitary police force and they, they basically recruited Royal Marines, you know, because they had a good reputation and they were tough. So they, mm. they, they drafted a load of Royal Marines. And that's why the police used to have the big collars, mm. like the bootneck, as they call it. Mm. And they call the Royal Marines a bootneck. So they, they were just hard men and they put in there and they were told, go out there and um, anyone robs a ship, you know, they die. And that's that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so it was all based on commerce. Mm. And it was all based on commerce of the sea because mm. all they had was maritime law. Yeah. So when they set up the courts, the first court was Thames Magistrates Court, which was on the Thames back then. It's not now. Um it was all based on maritime law. That's why they stand in a dock. Yeah. That's why it gets bailed out. Because yeah. if a boat's in trouble, you bail it out. So it's all to do with that. Yeah, shipped and sh yeah. yeah. You have all these uh, water-based terms, don't you? Well, that's what they call it, your worship. You know, your yeah, worship. That's right. yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, so it, it's, and, and the, the bench is, is mm. like the bridge of a boat. It's three steps up, you know. Mm. So a, a judge is three steps up on mm. a bench, you know. So it's all based on that. So it's not the law of the land, it's the law of the seas. Well, it's it? law of seas, yeah, yeah. You know, the boys in blue and, you know, um, yeah. and that's it. So it was all based on that. When they say, oh, it's conspiracy, all this about the, the economy, mm. you know, all the fiscal system controlling it. Well, it's not. Cause that's mm. what it was. So the energy that, that, that something was built on its inception is the energy that stays with it. So that mm. was built between a dispute between the trader uh, you know, the trader and, and, and mm. the merchant. And yeah. that still stands today. It's got nothing to do with kids mm. or anything and protecting the vulnerable. It's all to do with um, with protecting trade. Yeah. And it was it was interesting that someone said to me um, about incest, mm. the, the laws on incest, and they're really weird, right? Mm. So um, they said, why, why is it not against the law for um, a grandmother to have sex with... Um, no, oh, what was it again? Right, uh, a, a grandmother can have sex with a grandson. 
right? How's, why is that allowed? Yet a grandfather can't have sex with a granddaughter. That doesn't make sense. Mm. Well, 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 it depends how you're thinking at it. On a moral sense, it, of course it don't make sense. It's perverted. Mm. Why, would, why would a you know a grandson have sex with his grandmother? You know, or the other way around. You know. Um, but when you look at it on on the fact that um, a grandfather, mm. right, he has sex with his granddaughter, he could get her pregnant, and it's going to cause a birth defect. That's going to maybe cause Down syndrome. That's maybe going to cause a numerous amounts of birth defects because of the gene pool. Mm. But a young boy can't get an old woman pregnant because she's classed as barren. Mm. You know, she's over 50, the menopause. So it's no, not much chance right. of him getting her pregnant. So it's got absolutely nothing to do with perversion. It's all to do with, is this is this child going to go up, grow up to be a healthy member and productive member of society? Mm. Well, well, if not, then we have to outlaw it because everyone else has to pick up the bills. It's all still to do with money. Yeah. And it's the same with these kids' homes. Kids are moved about from home to home because they're traded like slaves were traded. Yeah. So when slaves were traded, when they were shipped from here, mm. they were sold to them. And then they, when they moved from this plantation to that plantation, there was always a trade of money because human beings have always been the ultimate commodity. Mm. Same as the children's homes. There's money. Every time a kid is moved from home to home, there's a trade in cash. Mm. You know, so it makes money. So these kids' homes were making big money. They were getting two grand per week per child. It was all about finance. So they weren't there to protect the kids and give them the best and give them a good education and all that. They weren't. And I'm guessing if there were good, there must be good people that work within there, but they just can't do anything, right? What can you do when what you're in a corrupt do? system? Yeah. And can't. that's affected what happened to you, yeah, right? Yeah, so, so this little girl Zoe turned around to me. She said, look... I'm being pimped out. Mm. And she's been pimped out by a woman who had a street name called Foxy. Mm. And we did get Foxy convicted. And um, uh, Foxy was a street prostitute who the police had known about for a long time. Mm. And there was always always rumours and intelligence reports that she was involved with young girls for a long time. And they did nothing. They did nothing to curtail it. Mm. Absolutely nothing. And she said, not just me, there's other girls. Um, so when you see there was this... Um, uh, drama about three girls in the north it was called three girls it was about mm. the grooming gangs in the north of england three mm. girls you know which is terrible but you know we we, we had dozens it must and, be going on uh, uh, rife in london well, one day i found yeah. 10 in one day 10 in one day mm. 10 kids in one day in prostitution mm. you know you know and i think the thing in manchester they had an incident room a whole squad there were two of us it was me and a girl mm. another girl and uh, uh, one girl led to another girl, led to another girl. Then there was boys being involved, mm. kids homes, and it was spiralling. Mm. And it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then names started coming out. Mm. And the people that were involved, uh, and it was getting higher and higher and higher and mm. higher. And then there was a, um, a threat come in on my life. There was intelligence report on my life. And there was a social worker came forward from Croydon. And she said, look, I hear what you're doing in, in North London and Central London. Um, you've got to help us in the South. You know, we've got the same. Mm. And we've been going to your unit mm. who was set up to deal with juveniles at risk, right? They never, didn't, they just yeah, didn't, didn't touch them. Yeah. They just didn't touch them. And um, and they said, but we've been going to them for a decade, you know, and there's girls mm. that they're dying. There's boys that are dying. There's one lad who was so in the latter stages of HIV, he was 11 and he's still being pimped out. Oh, There was one girl... Her vagina was so infected that she had open cysts in there and she was still being pimped out. And, and the social worker said, when she we, we visit there, when she go and see us, there is pus just oozing out of her legs and she's still being pimped out. And we go to your unit, they've done nothing. She's going to die. So I, I drafted a report and said, look, this is the reality. Mm. You know, we need to really stamp yeah. on this. This is just growing bigger and bigger mm. every day. And I was dragged in. I've got to be careful because I'm in civil court. Um, against the Met Police in a couple of months. Uh -huh. I'm suing them for their failures, you know. Mm. Um, I've had the government inquiry, which I've given evidence about their mm. failures, uh, so it's been heard. So, but again, I've still got to be careful. I'm not going to name anyone. But um, I was, um, when dragged in before um, the senior officer there, uh, who's now gone on to be one of the, the, the most senior officers in, in, in uh, the UK, mm. And he said to me, what you done? Mm. What you done, John? He said, listen, you're a good lad. At, you know, you're well mm. liked and you're good at what you do. He said, but I'm telling you what, you mention a word of what you found out outside this room. You're going to lose your home, your job and your children. You shut the F up. And I was like, what? 
but I, I knew he meant it, you know. I didn't mind the bloke. He was a nice bloke, you know. Mm. He was well liked, but he just honest, he yeah. cha- well he changed, you know. Mm. He changed, and I realised I'd trodden on some big toes here. He said, "You have no idea who or what you're dealing with. This is so big, you'll be thrown to the walls, and no one can help you. You must listen to me." And he said, "You must promise never ever to look into this again." Um, now. I, I didn't listen to him, I did the opposite to him and, and in due course I nearly did lose my home, my job and my children and my liberty and I will explain how. Um, I was removed from the, that inquiry, um, it went to court, there was conviction, shortly after the conviction uh, that, that Foxy was convicted, she was given I think 15 years, maybe something like that she was the first conviction under the new mm. legislation for grooming and for pimping out kids um, again a woman again you know woman paedophile so very rare mm. you know she'd been active for a long time but the saddest thing that the the little girl at the centre of it she was found dead under s- suspicious circumstances very shortly afterwards mm. and that broke me that really broke me because she wasn't protected this girl she was so brave mm. and she was really um her efforts went a long way to to opening this up the way it has done, you know? And so, you know, I always have a little moment, a prayer for that Mm. poor girl and what she went through. And um, the system let her down, the social services let her down, the Mm. police monumentally let her down. um, And it shows it's broken, it doesn't work. Mm. Um, But I went on to work with child protection in Haringey, in North London. I found... um, by the end of one week, 50 kids were being pimped out. Put a job together to sort of deal with it. These were kids that were in care homes that were just being taken to brothels. And it was just horrendous. It was the same pattern again, mm, but mm. just a different part of London. So within 10 minutes, uh, ringing up these kids' homes, about 20 kids' homes, I'd pick up the phone, how many kids you got? Let's say about five They'll get two grand per kid, you know, meant to be looking after these kids in care. These are kids that come from abuse. Mm. They're meant to get therapy and put their lives right. And they said, no, they, they get picked up at night. Three of them, three out of five will get picked up on average and they were taken to brothels and pimped out, you know. And that was that was consistent of all these care homes. So mm. within um, one afternoon, I found 10. By the end of the week, I found 50. And I set up a meeting with social services, NGO, non-governmental organisations, mm. outreach groups, all set up for kids. And the same thing was happened. I was threatened. I was threatened with someone who's very high up. And again, her details have been given over to, to both the National Crime Squads, the police complaints, and to, to the, the government inquiry. Mm. She's head up of one of the leading children's charities. And she basically said, you're treading on toes, you step away now, you're back down now. And then she colluded with a superintendent and basically got it all shut down. God, yeah. Uh, it's Unbelievable. In- incredible. And these people, and I say to people, you be careful who you give money to, these charities. Yeah. And these leading children's charities, I'm telling you now, I'm telling you, knowing what I know now, some aren't all they seem. And that's all I can say. I don't get sued by them. Yeah. But there's two main ones, and one always claims, always on the telly, saying we're helping kids, you're not helping kids. They are not helping kids the way they should be helping kids and um absolutely appalling so th- that again i get moved mm. um life sort of goes on um to a point where i start it, it has its toll on you. policing takes its toll on you you know mm. it, it's a tough job i was bringing up four kids i was then working also as a tree surgeon at weekend to get mm. extra money um, always on the go, but it was always in the back of my mind what had gone on, you know, what had happened, what had gone mm. on. And I was thinking, this is corruption. This can't be allowed to happen. So I um, really wanted to speak out, but I had no way of speaking out because you don't. It's just that culture you, you, mm. you can't. I needed. Yeah. I, I was getting reckless because what I was doing was I started smoking in the office mm. and I would drink, I'd come in drinking a can of beer in the morning. Mm. I wanted to be stopped. I, I was screaming out for someone to try and accost me, but no one did. Mm. I was doing, I sometimes I wouldn't even turn up for work. Mm. So I weren't bothering to turn up. I was thinking, no, no, I'm not going in. They'd ring me up. I said, no, I'm, I'm in the north. I'm not coming. And I, I really took the piss because mm. I wanted, I actually wanted to get arrested. 
you know, at, at the very at the, at the most, but at the very least, be accosted by senior officers, so mm. I could let them have it, so I mm. could use it as a platform to speak out. But Jimmy Savile got um, exposed, mm. and I thought, wow, this is brilliant. This yeah. is it. I, I've got it. And there was a couple of coppers come forward, so I linked in with them, and they put me in touch with politicians. So I linked mm. in with them. They put me in touch with the press. So I spoke to the press. Mm. I did. A, I did a, an interview. Um, a podcast interview with the UK column, lovely bloke called Brian Gerrish. Mm. Um, he promised me he wouldn't put it out, but he did. He just put it out, mm. and it saved my life. It mm. actually saved my life. What he did mm. it sounds dramatic, but it's true. It did. Mm. It's it definitely saved my liberty um, because they couldn't touch me because it was out there. Otherwise, mm. they, they would have nicked me. You know. Mm. Um, so I made an allegation of corruption in high office, and the strange thing is. Uh, this TV series Line of Duty has come out and there's a line in there and mm. it's and when the last series all about child abuse and the cover-ups in high office mm. and someone who dealt with the professional standards for the police has given my case details to, to, to the producers of that because it is identical to really? what I exposed and there was a line in it and I know that it's been plagiarised and someone has used my case to um, to earn money working with um bbc on on this mm. on this um drama and it was i rung up the corruption command police and said i need to speak to a high ranked officer they went well we'll put you through to pc so i said no no i'm not i am not talking to a uniformed officer no way and i'm not talking to a man I said i want a senior woman officer mm. and in the end they, they got it so a woman detective chief inspector rang me up she said can you come to a secure location and meet with us and it was really weird on my way there mm. i was accosted in a corridor by one of the men i was going to inform on he was there how are you john how you mm. doing and he started name dropping oh you know so and so screwed up the unit and you know and sorry to hear what you and he was part of the conspiracy to bring me down this guy mm. thinking what the hell was mm. he doing now mm. it was really odd so i sort of i didn't think i was I was really being um, surveilled or anything. I was later mm. to find out when I got my um, disclosure through from uh, from a civil case that I'd been under surveillance for two and a half years. Wow. Um, anyway, so I went up, this woman met me and she said, tell me something, John. Why is it that you want to speak to um, a senior woman detective? And I said, because you cannot roll up your trouser leg. And that's what the Masons do. You know, right. she just laughed. She said, I know exactly mm. what you mean. So they took my, over a period of days, they took my statement. Um, and then they said, look, you're bomb proof. You, you, you are bomb proof. But that's when the attack started. Um, all of a sudden I'm being served with discipline papers. they have gone through nearly 10 years of my internet records. My emails have been trawled. Um, they started pulling me up for data protection violation, which mm. would not only get me sacked, it get me in, in court. Mm -hmm. And one of the whistleblowers, she told me that, um, she said, listen, um, they're gonna have you for data protection violations, because that's what they do to all of us. Mm. Whenever we speak out, it's what they do. Um, they, uh, so I got, um, say arrested, it'll be summons by then, I got pulled in, and they said, right, you're gonna be um, sent to court for, um, and sent to a discipline panel for data protection violations. Mm for misuse of intelligence. Um, and I was worried. I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna lose my job. Mm. So I basically I walked out. Um, and then I was done first talking to the press. I never actually spoke to the press. They The story got leaked and I ended up in the Sun, the Star. Mm. Um, I did speak to the, the Express in the end, you know, but the Sun and the Star leaked a story about me. Um, so did me that. And then I was, um, I was arrested for, um, what was it again? Conspiracy to supply class A drugs. And they said, right, all the other cases against you, and they were mounting up, they were mm. really mounting up. And they said that they carry a two year sentence. This one carries a 15 year sentence. We got you. I went, well, what are you on mm. about? You know, and I refused to be interviewed. Mm. I refused to be interviewed. And um, they, um, 
I said, right, well, well here it is. And, and what, what, it, what it was was that mm. my friend was an undercover officer. And um, like most undercover officers, he went mad. They, 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 mm. Their mind goes, you know, it's too much for them, mm. you know. They, and they, they really run and ragged, you know. And he had something like about five different telephones, different identities and, and all sorts of things. And he, he'd lost the plot, gone mad, left the police and gone to live in France. Mm. And he got lonely and he was being invited to, to the UK to do a, an interview. Mm. He had trust issues with the police. and But he was my mate, I was his mate. And he used to, his legend was he would live as a tramp. He'd live on the street. And they'd send him all around the country and he'd just live as a tramp. He used to piss himself. And he would actually sm smell a piss. He would stand there and, and piss himself because that was his legend, you know? What do you mean by legend? That's his act. That was his act. Yeah, yeah that was right. his, his yeah. altar. His, yeah, they call it, they call talk it about legend. taking the uh, yeah. Um, what do they call it? An acting uh, yeah. method acting he to was the extreme. Unbelievable! This mm. guy mm. bearded, and he used to have a bottle of methadone mm. on him. So I said, Are "You still living as a tramp?" And he replied, "Yeah." And I said, "Well, when you come to London, give me a call." And it was all done through the police email because mm. my surname was so easy to, mm. and I was on the police email system. So you know, if you put in John Wedger at MetPolice dot co dot whatever mm. you're going to get me and he did i said well um i'll tell you what you obviously got the, not got it anymore you bring the tenant super and i'll bring the method down we'll have a cocktail yeah it's a joke. It. <laughs> yeah. joke it was clearly a joke yeah so when i found out that's what it was i laughed i couldn't stop laughing and they mm. they, they they thrust the um the, the papers inside me say you've got to sign for this i said yeah i'll sign for it give me a pen because i'm going to stick this straight in your eye mm. right and the bloke, he froze. He didn't know what to do. It was like that. It, it was a, a detective inspector, and he was like, mm. "I said, no, f, f off, leave me mm. alone, leave me alone. If that's all you got, leave me alone." So next thing, I got threats to kill. Oh God! Come my way, you know. <laughs> and then, because I walked out, they stopped paying me. Mm. So I've now got no income. Mm. The bank came round to to look at repossession because I can't pay my mortgage. Mm. Um, you know, the banks get a hard time. But a woman that came round, she heard. Mm my story and and she'd been in the care home mm. she put her arms around me she said no one's touching your home john you make a minimum payment as like a pound a month or something and the moment mm. you're back on we're back on with you mm. so i can't knock the banks i can't mm. you know when they say the banks do this they were actually good to me yeah i'm not a fan mm. of banks mm. um but this woman mm. bless her she worked for natwest bank and i'll tell you what god bless you whoever you are you know you 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 good woman good woman um, and I started then working with um, victims and survivors, activists. Mm. The, the, the most notable one is a man called Bill Maloney, mm. a tough guy, you know, a little gangster from, from the streets of Peckham, mm. lived on the streets since the age of 11, a victim of, of horrific child abuse. My best mate, mm. and my best mate to this day, you know, my best, I, you know, he's, this guy offered to, give me his life savings, his money that he'd saved up for his funeral to pay my mortgage one month. Mm. You know, all my other mates in the police, yeah, a couple stood by me, of course, yeah. but all of them gone. They didn't want to know. Mm. Refused to give statements, refused to back me up. Mm. Um, and then I've got an ex-gangster saying, you know, saying, yeah, I'm That's with good. you, I'm with you. So Shows you the real mates are, doesn't it? Unbelievable, unbelievable. Mm. And I've got to give a big shout out to a lady called Tracy. She, she does a lot in mm. the therapeutic community around North London, not too far from here. And she did the same. I'd only known her a couple of weeks, you know, a couple of years, sorry. And she said the same. She said, I'm going to sell my van and um, my mm. my boyfriend's going to sell the van. We're going to give you the money. Oh. And, well, you know, How lovely is that? Love, good, good, good mm -hmm. woman. Mm. So he, I was threatened with the loss of my home, my children, mm. my job. So I'm now looking at losing my job because I've got to go before a discipline panel on, mm. on nine cases, you know. Mm. One of them's going to stick. Mm. You know, by the law of averages, one of them's going to stick. And that's it, my job's gone, you know. And there was a conspiracy against me. Um, I'd been under surveillance for two and a half years, I later found out. So everywhere I was going, there was, mm. I was being surveilled. Um, I got a job on a building site, cash in hand. And I, um, you know, again, I'm like nearly 50 years old and I'm working 10 hours a day doing grafts, you mm. know. Um, I started block laying for um a building firm mm. and again they've gone about like i said about racism you know you know you listen to their banter you would have never got away with that in the police so you know it's mm. very mm. but you know i'm out in all weathers now you know with 
with the guys and you know um, one of them he'd been in the care system in, in, in prison and all sorts and I'm getting 80 quid you know for a 10 hour day I mean I'm working God, yeah. minimum wage hard graft you mm. know um, and then I ended up in the national papers and this guy liked me who employed me he liked me and he said I've got to let you go mm. I said why well, he said you've been in the papers and you're probably under surveillance and I went no don't be stupid but I, was, yeah. I, I was I yeah. was under surveillance yeah. and um and he said, look, they'll come down on me, you know. So mm. he said, I don't want to. So I had to leave that. Then I went and I started doing uh, gardening and tree surgery because mm. I had to pay my bills, mm. Mm. you see. And I wanted I wanted to pay the bank because it helped me. Mm. So I wanted to help. And I had to pay. And so uh, now the cases, the CPS are taking the cases on. So not only are the internal discipline people going to sack me, the CPS are now running with the cases and they're going before a court. Um, so I'm looking at prison. I'm looking at a Crown Court trial minimum, you know, uh, because I'm not accepting anything. I'm going to Crown mm. Court and I'm going to, and you know, and I started saying, well, take me to court. I'll, I'll see you in court. And this is all, to go back, this is all because you wanted to pursue it all. Yeah, to speak out to about speak what, out the about cover the, up the around cover children yeah. being pimped out and those yeah. involved. Um, and I, I still didn't realise how deep and dark it was getting. Yeah. Um, so, what then happened was one of my boys, and this was this was a pivotal moment in my mm. life. One of my children was involved in in a, a catastrophic and life changing accident. Um, I was out working. I was mm. digging um, in in Barnet actually. I was I was doing mm. some digging work, and it was in the winter, mm. ten at night. I'm still digging, right? Still digging, and I go back to my car, sort of knackered, finished. I'm working with a Russian, and I've got fifty missed calls. Fifty missed calls. What's going on? And one of my children's in hospital. Please, please call, call, call anyway. I ring up my oldest boy, he's screaming at me. He said, it's one of my lads. He said, he's, he's seriously ill, he's broken his neck. I went, no, what? He said, his spine's mm. damaged, he's broken it. He's, he's in a coma, he's... And they've taken him to Cambridge to, to a specialist. And I, so I've driven mm. all the way to Cambridge and I'm covered in mud and smoke because mm. we had a fire and I get there and the surgeon comes out and said, look, he's gone into surgery. We've got a, the best surgeon that's come up from London to do it. He said, um, if we can, his spinal column had been severed by 95%. Mm. It was hanging off. It was like, Jeez. like that, it was hanging off. Mm. And they held no hope for him, you know. Mm. And they said, if, it, if we do it in, in under 40 minutes, he'll live. If it takes four hours, he, he will eventually die. Go home, get some rest. And I can remember driving home and as I drive down this black, pitch black road, shooting star went straight across my car. Mm. I was like, wow. Mm. Thank you, God. And the phone went. Mm. The phone went. And uh, it was a surgeon. It's been successful. Mm. You know, he's, he's going to live. So, like, oh, man. So I went home, had a wash, went back to the hospital. And he was um, in intensive care for many, many months. Many months, he, he was slipping in and out of comas. He was mm. getting better than anyone who's ever had a child in um, intensive care or, or a, a relative intensive care. They call it the roller coaster. One mm. minute you're up, they're getting better. Next minute, they'll yeah. get an infection. Mm. So all this we're seeing on the news at the moment mm. about ICUs and people in comas. Listen, if you're on a ventilator, which mm. a lot of people are on ventilators, yeah. stroke victims go on ventilators, right? Mm. Spinal injury victims go on ventilators. Mm. Most of the people in ICUs, when I was in and out of there, mm. for the best part of six months, were mm. on ventilators. Mm. And most of them get induced comas, mm. medically induced comas go on ventilators. So we're seeing it in the news all the time, gosh, shock, horror. Mm. ICUs are always fully booked, mm. and most of the people are on ventilators. You know, so this isn't a new thing. Mm. So when they're going on all the time about hospitals packed and all that, mm. you tell me in the last 40 years when they haven't been packed. Exactly. You know, you don't go into nursing to get an easy life. Mm. It's a hard, hard line yeah. from, from the moment you walk in. I've had a moment. nurse on the show, actually. Do you know what I mean? It. Yeah. It's just, and, and someone said, you go into an ICU, you're on ventilators. I've been there, mate. They're mm. all on bloody mm. ICU. Mm. It's just mad. So, you mm. know, again, I'm not knocking the reality of what's going on, but... Mm. There's a lot of scaremongery in amongst this, and there's mm. probably a very profound, sinister reason for a lot of that. Mm. And you definitely don't collapse an economy for, for, for that either. Um, you know, so uh, a few months into it, I then um, go in the hospital one day, 
and he's there and he's being, acting a bit odd, my boy. He's on all these machines and he's acting a bit strange. So I, I just go on. I'll go on. I'm going to get some rest. Mm. So I've got no money. I've literally, I've got not a penny left, you know. I become a blood donor because that allowed me to park in the blood donor's spot because mm. they give me a sticker. Mm. So if I put it in my windscreen, I could park in a blood donor's spot, mm -hmm. you know, and not get paid a parking fines. Mm. Um, and I could also go in there and get free biscuits. You know, that's how bad it mm. got, you know. And I get a call, uh, I get home, I'm, I, I, I had my first can of beer in ages. I opened this can of beer, and I always remember it was Sam again, I was drinking it, my phone went, and it's the, the consultant, can you get back to the hospital, please? I went, yeah. He said, if you can bring someone, bring someone. Well, there was no one. My mm. kids were in mm. bed. Yeah. My other three were in bed. And I, I zoomed up the hospital and I go there and I'm met by three consultants. And they said, I'm sorry, um, we've lost your son. I went, well, he was all right earlier. He went, unfortunately, his organs have collapsed. His mm. breathing stopped. He's gone into cardiac arrest. He was flatlined for seven and a half minutes, maybe longer mm. by the time we, we got to him. Mm. We were reckoning about 10 minutes without oxygen. We've managed to get a heart beat back he's on full 100 percent life support there is nothing more he could be given mm. um it's only his heart that's you know uh, you know that's, that's that when that goes it, but he is probably going to be brain dead mm. um if we keep inflating his lung to 100 percent, which we have to we're going to destroy the alveoli in his lungs and they'll be redundant so mm. at the end of five days we're going to be turning the machine off if you want to take legal representation, then we can put you in touch with mm. our legal team and get underway. And I went, no. And there, and I worked on family liaison. You've got to give it to people straight. You can't mm. muck yeah, about. Course, yeah. You have to say, sorry, your son's dead. Mm. You, you know, boom, let it hit them. Yeah. And then, then you they can negotiate. Deal with it. Yeah. You have to do it. So I got it. And they did everything they could. They did everything they could. Anyway, so I said, can I stay with him? And they went, yeah. So I stayed with him for three days. So I telephoned um, someone I used to work with and said, like, just to let you know, this is what's happened. Um, I'm not playing games with the Met Police anymore. I'm not I'm not playing these stupid games. If, my, if, if I lose my son, I'm waging war on them. There's going to be problems. I said, Scotland Yard will burn mm. by the end of the day. It will burn mm. with a commissioner in it. And that's what I said. You know, I said, so she went, okay. I said, just let, let the mm. team... Because I still had like a, yeah. a an off uh, a, an inspector that, that was I was still employed by him, but they weren't paying me at mm. all. Yeah. Um, so she said, "Look, I'll let them know." I said, "They stay off my back because if one of them comes around to me, I lose my son." I said, "They die. They will die." Mm. She went, "All right." So she went and told my senior officer, and the next thing, something went on there, right? And I didn't, I didn't know what, but it turned out they tried to discipline her, to silence her, right? So they said, "You should have." done this you should have done that and they started attacking her mm -hmm. and, and she's made a stern of stuff this girl you know yeah and she turned around and said you don't bully me you, you mm. know you've got the wrong person no way i've done the right thing here and uh anyway so for three days i just prayed i prayed i went in the chapel and i prayed and i prayed and i prayed and on the third day of praying my son woke up mm. he woke up and i said move your foot left foot he did move your right foot he did and he grabbed did that with his hands right and I just said, I love you, son. And he murmured. He's got these pipes yeah. in his gob, so he murmured, I love you too. When I'm going home, boy, I'm going home. And he looked a bit confused. I knew his brain was okay. He was going to live. Mm. I think, oh, I've got my son back. Mm. I remember ringing my mum and said, mum, he's going to live. Mm. He's woke up and my mum's crying. And, mm. and I drive home and I get home and I'm exhausted. I'm worn out. I'm flat out. I get back on fumes, you know. There's nothing left in my petrol tank. I get back in. And as I get back in, two coppers there. So they were arresting you for child neglect. Oh my God. And yeah, and that's what they did. The Metropolitan oh, no. Police sent two officers from Hertfordshire Police to come and arrest me for leaving my 15 year old home alone with my 26 year old, I must add. Um, yeah, and that, that's how they treat me. So that's why I put nothing past them. Mm. I have no respect for, for the Commissioner Cresta Dick, none whatsoever. Mm. She is not serving the public. Mm. Um, the public need, you know, she's your servant. I would say remove her. She's an appalling individual. Mm. Um, knew about my situation, did nothing to remedy it, and, and was behind the sanctioning of these officers coming round. 
Um, but, but that's when it changed for me. Mm. And no longer could they bully me. I've been hurt so bad. Yeah. So the threats that went on, mm. you're going to lose your home, mm. your job, your children. Well, near enough, everyone panned out. Mm. And I fought back. So I'd say to anyone who whistleblows, you know, don't be frightened. Mm. You're going to get hurt. Like any battle, you're going to get a smack on the nose. You're going to get hurt. Mm. But you must never run. Mm. You must stand and you must fight because they're the cowards. If they're doing that to you... They're the cowards. They've got a lot to lose. Mm. They're attacking. It's a bit like the trolls. They're attacking because they've got something to lose. Yeah. The good ones will back you. Mm. The good, honourable ones will back you. So that started my campaign of activism. And I decided then to use the skills I'd learned uh, as a specialist interviewer to um, basically um, get the word out there mm. for the victims and survivors of abuse. So linked in with uh, Bill Maloney, mm. um, and started podcasting mm. um, and then started speaking to survivors, putting their story out, getting their story out there. And then I was I was talking to profilers, so like Kareen. I spoke to her criminal profile and then I thought, right, well, I, I need another professional. So I spoke to the head of um, mental health for the NHS, who was a guy that would be used by the Home Office to adjudicate any murder where someone claims insanity. They'd send this guy, mm. uh, a lad called Ali. Um, he gave a podcast and he said, what you're doing is important because mm. most of my patients have come from sexual abuse. And then the suicide, so um, I'd be speaking to people that were dealing with self-harming mm. uh, and then the survivors and, and it was going on. But then one started happening was one person would talk about the satanic ritual mm. element. So one in 10 would talk about it and I didn't really want to go there mm. I had dealt with it in the police. I dealt with opia, which was a Jamaican form. So it was a voodoo form, mm. uh, but been bastardized by the Jamaican community and, and heavily used out there. Um, and I dealt with some witchcraft that come from... Vo the voodoo, what I found out, is comes from the French-speaking African mm. nations, and witchcraft is English-speaking mainly. Mm. So the Congolese were very much into indigenous belief. And this, this sounds like sweeping statements, but mm. it's not because when you consider that Benin mm. is seventy percent voodoo worship as their religious oh, belief. Is it really? Benin, yeah, and Benin yeah. is nestled between it's Ghana, a tiny country Ghana, in yeah. West Africa. Isn't yeah, it? next yeah. to Ghana and Nigeria. See? Yeah. So, so it, it, it's, yeah. it's it's very very big. But the satanic abuse hadn't knowingly dealt with it. Mm. Um, so at that point, what 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 do you what does that mean to you that term satanic ritual? Well, well, not much. And then a guy called Wilfred Wong. Mm. Um, wanted to speak to me and this mm. guy had, had done an interview and I'd seen his interview he's an ex-military um, guy from Singapore mm. uh, he's a barrister and, and a parliamentary lobbyist and a committed Christian mm. and uh, he had spent the last 30 years um, investigating satanic ritual abuse and had uh, looked into many many cases and he, mm. he really has the evidence of, of the reality of this so we started um, working together, as it were, you know. And so I was using my skills, he was mm. using his skills. Mm. And, and there was a lot. He's currently in prison, Wilfred. He was arrested on um, suspicion of kidnap um, of a child. Uh, but mm. it looks like it's a botched rescue attempt. That's what it looks like, you know. Mm. Uh, so he'll be in Crown Court and he'll fight this. This is a good man that does a lot of good. Mm. The press did try and negatively steer him but you know mm. since when were they the oracle of truth exactly, anyway yeah. you know we can't trust them mm. you know the Absolutely. date and it's that's it isn't it you know mm. um and then people started coming forward so the moment i did interview with them i people come forward and these were people that have been in care homes mm. as well and then they but they were different to the other survivors the other survivors are very traumatized and would have a history of drug addiction maybe mm. or an alcoholism a lot of anger a lot of mm. violence mm. I started getting a lot of organised, ex-organised criminals speaking mm. up. Um, uh, notifiably, one of them was an ex-member of the Cray Twins firm called Chris Lambriano, right. who went away for the murder of Jack Hatmovit. He, he mm. sort of, um, him and his brother Tony Lambriano. Um, Chris, I, I call him my uncle. We, we've become mm. that close. Right. He's such a good man. Mm. You know, he doesn't advocate, advocate um criminality at all you know the blokes are commit christian and, and and what he does now he he, he sort of um he spearheads campaigns to sort of help victims and survivors of abuse that have been caught up in alcohol and drug 
right. and knife not, the, crime. not necessarily the satanic ritual abuse stuff. But um, no, not knowingly anyway, yeah, not, not knowingly, knowingly yeah. but he's a man of God and he yeah. understands, you know, the snares and the traps that the devil lays for us all, you know, because we're going down a spiritual realm now. Mm. And and then you started getting the victims of satanic abuse and they were different because they had a thing called DID, mm. Disassociated Identity Disorder, multiple personalities. Yeah. And they would change personalities and some would even physically change. Wow. Um as I mean, a coping mechanism from the pain, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. It, it, pain they it's, must have gone it's through. the way the yeah the, the mind works. Yeah. There's a spiritual element to it as well as 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 a mental element. But for instance, um, they'll be tortured. Mm. So part of the torture would be to drown them. Mm. So the kids would be drowned to the point of death. They want to induce death. Mm. Christian, it's an inversion of Christianity, not yeah. an inversion of Buddhism yeah. or atheism or Hinduism. It's an inversion of Christianity. Yeah. So I've yet to deal with satanic abuse, which, which, which attacks Buddhism or anything like yeah. that. Satanic abuse, even the African voodoo is an attack on Christianity, the inversion of, mm. of, of what Jesus Christ did, you know. Um, and so they'd want to induce death. Yeah. So they'd drown the kid. So the kid would adapt a personality which would, could deal with water. Well, they're not dying, though. They're near death. It's they're, like they're, near they're, death. Yeah, yeah. Or they would bring them back. They, some were experts in reviving kids. Right, okay. There was a, a, an infamous child murderer called Sidney Cook, and that was one of his things would do, would strangle the kid, and he right. could revive them by doing CPR and right. become and an part expert. Part of that torture is just for their titillation, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and also, sometimes when a kid is, is going through the death throes, they would rape them, mm. and that would make the muscles tighter. Right, okay. So, you know, they would be anally or vaginally mm. raping a kid while strangling them and killing them, you know, mm. at the same time. It's just sick in the head. There's, there's more to it as well with the, the blood and, and yeah, that, that has well. to be. It's all to do with blood. Yeah, blood. Yeah. Blood is the currency. Yeah, right. And and what I was to find out was that satanic abuse was highly structured. Yeah, it's it's ancient. It's Babylonian. This mm. goes back to Sumerian times. Mm. It's the worship of Baal. Mm. Um, yeah. Um, and Moloch. Yeah. And Lucifer and Satan. Mm. Right. Um, and the what i'm learning now is voodoo is to do with the worship of leviathan mm. these are all biblical names yeah these aren't these aren't th these are all judo christianic names these aren't anything mm. that is named in in um Egyptian the quran or, 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 or yeah, yeah, yeah you do not I mean it's yeah. it's however um a lot of the egyptian mm. text and all that is yeah. stems from the babylonian stuff and mm. and it's well established so mm. It was even um, cited by, mm -hmm. there was a chief constable called Mike Ville, mm. who was in charge of Wiltshire Police. Lovely man, you know, about the mm. only chief constable worthy to earn that title. Mm. You know, and the people of Wiltshire, you, you, you were privileged to have a proper man, a proper man. And I mean that in every sense of the term, mm. policing you, mm. a guy with a backbone, yeah. not these spineless morons that, that mm. we see in every other county. Mm. Um, at the UK now and, and I will denigrate them because they're doing nothing mm. to stop this nothing mm. and he need to be called out these people these yeah, are public course. servants that are yeah. failing mm. monumentally failing and no mm. one is having the spine to speak out mm. you know and, and, and I'm, but I will mm. I will I hold no fear for these people no fear at all and he spoke out uh, about it he was attacked and rubbish like all of us mm. that speak out are attacked and rubbish and um you know, someone said to me, Sean Atwood said to me, you were the most controversial uh, police whistleblower. I said, because I'm the only one who talks about satanic abuse. Yeah, the That's why. The balls to talk yeah, about it. yeah, I'm not talking about mm. drug dealing. I'm not talking about diplomats. I'm talking about satanic ritual abuse yeah. and the reality of it. And the others aren't. So yeah. damn right, I get attacked. And I'm proud to be attacked. Yeah. If you're not attacked, then you're not doing you're your not job. You're not working hard enough, You're not I doing say. your yeah. job. It's <laughs> Wilfred yeah, said. Yeah. He said, use that yeah, as an accurate, actually, agent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and Mike Ville turned around and he, and he said that, that Ted Heath, I'm 120% the man's a paedophile yeah. and a, a, a satanic abuse um, mm. perpetrator. And he said it. Ted Heath's name has, has cropped up on a thing called the Rains List. Mm. Now, for those who don't know what the Rains List is, it's R-A-I-N-S, Rains List. It's an acronym for Ritual Abuse um, Information Network Support. And there was a leading psychiatrist, psychologist and therapist at the Morsley Hospital um, in South East London and she was um, looking into abuse survivors and mm. she started looking at the DID mm. and she realised that those with the multiple personalities had one thing in common, ritual abuse. Mm. So she interviewed them 
and she starts seeing other things in common that they were naming names, certain names. Mm. So, so if a name was mentioned more than twice, it went on the list. Mm. So there's an extended list, mm. and then so it's corroborated, mm. you know, by a minimum of three people now. Mm. So it went on the list. Sixteen pages of names. There's actors. There's politicians. Mm. There was one of the senior officers on the unit I was on the vice unit mm. on there. Mm. Um, so I even wrote to the IOPC and said, this needs investigating. Mm. And I got a letter back saying, John Mitchell, we're not even going to entertain you. We're not even going to answer your letters. Mm. You know, so the IOPC, you know what I mean? They, they need to go to hell, a lot of them, because mm. they are deliberately failing it. Mm. Uh, you know, to, so the head of, of a unit that deals with, with child sexual abuse victims is named publicly by a professional mm. on a list which yet to be denigrated and discredited he is named on there. Not once has he taken it to civil court. Not mm. once has it been disputed. Mm. You know, and this bloke's drawing a police pension, and he's named as a systemic abuse survivor. So, the the one thing I then noticed was that you know what is satanic ritual abuse? Mm. By the way, we've got five minutes left. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Frank's just giving me the five. Well, well that unfortunately. Well, that will have to be the topic yeah. of. Something. We could actually leave it. Leave it. Yeah, if yeah. you want, we could. Um, we yeah. could Go into that on the next one. Of leave course. A clip yeah. Here. I'd love to go in more, but I promised Frank uh, just two hours. Well, well, what what I will do for you on this one, John. Next yeah. time I come down, I'll get a whiteboard and I'll draw out yeah. a hierarchy oh, of satanic abuse. Wow. And how it operates. Yeah. You know? That'd be fantastic, yeah. Because no. I think this is good because we set up the, the the story, the backstory. We've got a good picture of the the evils that are going on and and, yeah. and how it how it sort of trickles down into all institutions well, and it goes right to the heart of the the, the top echelons of power, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and what I want to talk about when I return is those in power. Yeah. So people that are involved in government. Yeah. Uh, and a group called Pi. Yeah. Pedophile Information Exchange and the politicians yeah. are openly supporting this group and and this is going to be a naming and shaming forum but it's public domain so there's no libelous stuff mm. here and some are dead and they need to be spoken about these people mm. you know? yeah i mean it's funny because if you'd have spoken about all this even five ten years ago people would have said you're a lunatic oh yeah but now it's sort of all come out jimmy savile god the bless first jimmy domino. savile yeah god that, bless jimmy savile yeah, you know? that, that first domino actually yeah. sort of created a created a ripple and, effect didn't and, it and that, that's domino the ir- effect. that's the irony of jimmy savile the bloke was an active satanist yet he did God's work. He's got no idea. It's the last thing he wanted well, to do. Yeah, not in a good way. Not but in a good no, way. But, but it, it did manage to he, open he things up. He was a catalyst. He's an evil yeah. man and I hope he rots in hell, which he is. Yeah. But he was a catalyst. For and, all this opening up. And it made yeah. it credible what victims and survivors have been saying for years and years and years. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Yeah. So we'd love to get into that again, I think, and go into the satanic ritual abuse stuff. And uh, yeah. You know, and if you could maybe show us how it all... I will show you. I will show you exactly how it works. I will yeah. draw it out yeah. for you the whole hierarchy, yeah. uh, you know, and how it operates within the government. And also uh, another element which doesn't get mentioned, and that is uh, voodoo and yeah. juju and opia and, uh, y- you know, the African witchcraft, which is very active in the UK at present. Very, And very that's child-related, right? Child exactly. It's devil yeah. worship. Yeah. There's child sacrifice in it. Right, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of gangsters that are involved in it, Yeah. you know, and, and you can even... Go on, online and you can make contact with a, a witch doctor who's advertising services to protect you. And, and it's all wow. done. And it will all be a blood ritual. Yeah, that's uh, terrifying, but also intriguing because I yeah. really want to know about that. I think other people should know about and that. No one's doing anything about no it. No one's talking about it. No, no it's buried. Um, and also little things like I'd quite like to talk to you about Jill Dando at some point. Yeah, I think yeah. she was exposing some paedophilia within Jill the Jill Dando and the McCanns. And the McCanns, I was going to ask you about. I mean, yeah. you know, they're not like Jill Dando. They're, they're wrong. They're yeah. bad. I think there's something very, very Awful. fishy going on with that as Awful, well. Awful, appalling, yeah. you know, yeah. and how they got away with it, I'll never know. Yeah. And why are the police throwing money at them? Yeah. They, I mean, there's sh- th- be tens of thousands of children going missing. Why are they hyper-focusing on Madeleine McCann? I don't, I mean, that, why, why, why were the parents there? not arrested in the UK for the yeah. minimum of child neglect? Yeah. You know, there's child abandonment there, clear case of child abandonment yeah. they could have run with. And, and it's a knock on effect of the McCann case, which, which collapsed, was, was part of uh, the process in collapsing the kids' home case at Hope de la Grande in Jersey. Mm. And, and it's, it, you know, Kate McCann had a part to play in that, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. You know? And I'd like to speak about that if I may as yeah, well. Absolutely, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Everything I talk about, I want to quantify, I want to evidence. Yes, you exactly. know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist. This is conspiracy reality. I've mm. been at the centre of a conspiracy. Mm. 
and conspiracy is pencilled into statute law, you know? Yeah. So if two or more people get together for the purpose of committing serious crime, then it's a conspiracy, providing they're not husband and yeah, wife. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So, uh, so it's um, it's not nonsense. It does go on, yeah. People do 100%. conspire, and that's a reality. And people need to, people that just keep calling people conspiracy theorists need to really, you know, get it through their heads that you know, without you can't have corruption without conspiracy. You have to conspire before of there's course. corruption. So to say conspiracy that you are conspiracy theorist is like it's, it's just living in a fantasy world. Well, they're it's just ridiculous. denigrating people, and exactly. I'd like to go on also how they denigrate victims and survivors with the yeah. Bad Character Act. I think that needs you know bring that legislation into light. Yeah, you know, and, and and a call out to all these human rights lawyers, and you should be jumping on on the mm. on the case of these care home survivor groups and helping yeah. them. Yeah. If you want to do something honourable, help them, because mm. they need help and they need legal advice for free. You know. Yeah. And just on that note, what's your um, what can we signpost people to your websites or? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I I was a very active um, Facebook podcaster. I was one of the UK's fastest growing mm. podcasters. Um, uh, due to just trolls and all that, I've mm. stopped it. I couldn't be bothered with it. I couldn't be bothered yeah. with, with the nutters out there. And, and I mean that in a mm. nice respect and the vexatious nutcases. I have got a website, the John Wedge Foundation. I'm not updating anything mm. at the moment. Uh, you can get me email. You can email me, uh, John Wedge, J-O-N, Wedge, foundation at gmail.com, mm -hmm. you know, um, because I can monitor the emails then and, and I can decide who I answer and who I don't. Mm -hmm. That's how I get, but my work now is very, very covert okay. now. Um, so a lot of what I do will not be publicized anymore, but there will be um, YouTube interviews going out. They're going out still, but um, how I operate before in a very open manner, mm. that's them days are finished, you know. Yeah. I spent okay. my time in the trenches. I'm, yeah, you know, yeah. I've been promoted. Fair, fair enough. Yeah, you deserve yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So. All right, John. Well, yeah, thanks for that, man. That was a lot of, yeah, uh, yeah it was uh, quite. A lot to yeah. take in there but hopefully you know this is just the reality of life that this goes on and this darkness needs to come up to the surface yeah and, and um people like yourself are just bringing it to light you know and shine the light in the sewer and, and let them yeah. rats run yeah. let them rats run mm. speak out get justice and with justice you get healing yeah you know and, and all the free will to triumph it takes but for good men to do nothing yeah and i'm not one of them i'm not going to do nothing i certainly ain't you know yeah. i will i will die trying yeah you know, god bless that's you a my perfect message that's yeah. a perfect message to end on all right everyone that's uh, raising the bar myself john cooper and the incredible john wedger here um yeah please if you if you if you like what we're trying to do here and bring on these types of guests then please uh give the video a like please hit subscribe please share it with your friends and uh you know we can continue to get the likes of john on again and uh, we can go into uh, you know, go into this subject in a lot more yeah, depth because yeah, there is a lot more to it. There's a lot no, more I'm, I'm available. You just just let me know and I'll come yeah. straight back. You're, you're only down the road from yeah. me. It's no no drama at all. Cheers, mate. All right. Thanks, everyone.